Greetings and welcome to our webinar entitled Emerging Disruptive Technology, which is focused on the Middle East and Africa. My name is Jesse Rute. I'm CEO of Three Stones International, which is a strategy management and research firm focused on Africa. Uh, Three Stones has partnered with NATO Self Hub for the last three years to produce webinars informing NATO on relevant topics. And I'm happy to be joining you today to support the facilitation of this webinar. Um, I want to provide some insights into the webinar format before we get started with uh, our moderator. As you have seen in the agenda, we will have two sessions moderated by Dr. David Kukillan. Audience members will have the opportunity to comment on the sideboard chat, which will be moderated by Three Stones. Relevant questions and comments will be shared with the moderator in order to be brought forward during the question and answer part of each session. Especially active audience members on the sidebar chat will be asked to comment and participate during the social networking hour. In addition to participating via the chat, we encourage you to tweet at hashtag EDT South to interact and engage with NATO on Twitter. That's hashtag EDT South. Our webinar will be live streamed and I take this opportunity to remind you that this is a public event and comments, views and content shared in this event will be public and will be also utilized by NATO for outreach and publication purposes. Once again, thank you for participating in this webinar. Um, Dr. Kukulin will begin with uh, uh, introductions. Please stand by and I look forward to engaging with you on the sidebar chat. Thank you. And over to you, Dr. Kukulin. Thanks, Jesse, and welcome everybody to uh, our, uh, our webinar. Um, we are, as mentioned, we are co-sponsored um, by NATO's Allied Command Transformation uh, in Norfolk, Virginia, and by NATO Southern Hub in Naples, Italy. We have a fantastic lineup of expert presenters uh, and discussants today, and we're looking forward to a, a really lively uh, and robust discussion. So to, let, to get us started, I'd like to introduce Rear Admiral John Tamman from NATO ACT in Norfolk. Rear Admiral Tamman is from New Jersey in the US. He's a nuclear uh, submarine warfare officer. He's been a squadron engineer, uh, force nuclear power officer for the Atlantic Submarine Force. Uh, he worked in OPNAV uh, N97, which is the uh, undersea warfare part of the Naval staff, uh, and also has a background in operational energy, including uh, renewable energy in the Pentagon. Um, as a flag officer, he served as Deputy Director for Plans and Policy, otherwise known as J5 at US Stratcom. He commanded uh, Submarine Group 9, and then he returned to OPNAV N97 uh, as Director for Undersea Warfare uh, in the Pentagon. He's currently serving as the Deputy Chief of Staff for Strategic Plans and Policies uh, at uh, ACT in Norfolk. So I'm delighted to uh, invite Admiral Tamman, who has an incredibly rich background in technology and its application uh, in the operational environment to open our seminar. Uh, Admiral Tamman, the floor is yours. Good, David, thank you. And always humbled to be on, in the same webinar as you. Uh, I greatly appreciate your work in our Chiefs of Transformation Conference last fall. Uh, so again, I expect uh, great things out of, out of today's webinar from you. Uh, mm -hmm. That said, uh, good morning, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, on behalf of my boss, the Supreme Allied Commander, uh, Transformation General Lenato, welcome to today's webinar, where we are going to uh, address probably one of the most uh, challenging and difficult topics uh, that the Open Series has looked at recently, and that is emerging and disruptive technologies in the, uh, in the Middle East and Africa. And I say that because we just uh, here at ACT wrote the military advice to the international staff on our recommendations uh, regarding emerging and disruptive technologies. And what's so challenging uh, is that uh, most of these technologies are being developed and are available commercially. And, uh, and again, in, in the, uh, the organizations we're, we're concerned with in the Middle East and Africa, they are not necessarily as constrained by ethical, uh, legal, and moral standards that the rest of uh, uh, the Western nations are constrained by. So I think, I think today's discussion will be uh, robust and, and, and perhaps at times uncomfortable, but I, I challenge you to address some of those issues where uh, you know, bad actors within the Middle East and Africa uh, may use emerging and destructive technologies for bad purposes. And then again, what are the opportunities to use those technologies for good purpose 
uh, to you know, increase stability in the region. Um, as you know, Allied Command Transformation is NATO, NATO's Warfare Development Command for the Alliance. We conduct strategic level research, analysis, and conceptual development in order to identify potential threats and opportunities to inform strategic decisions. And again, that's what we're looking for out of today's discussion with you all. Um, I'm also very happy to be partnered with Hub of the South. We've had some very uh, productive projects over the last several years uh, to include um, topics as diverse as mass migration, climate change, energy security, and the impact of those on the security environment in the Middle East and Africa. Um, so I encourage you to participate in the question and answer sessions after each panel, and especially take part in the networking session near the end of the event. Uh, this networking session has been deliberately scheduled to facilitate additional interaction between the audience and the panelists. And I know we have a great set of panelists to allow all participants to present their own points of view and discuss it. This is the very purpose of an event like this. So remember, this is all about open. So again, welcome and enjoy. And David, back to you to uh, lead us through this very challenging topic. Over. Uh, thanks, John. Um, and I would now like to uh, introduce our co-host uh, uh, from NATO Southern Hub, Brigadier General David A. Ray. He's a pilot officer of the Italian Air Force, graduate of the Italian Air Force Academy. Uh, he has more than 2,700 hours of flying time in G91 and Tornado aircraft. Uh, he served in the former Yugoslavia uh, and later as a Joint Air Task Force Commander uh, for ISAF in Afghanistan. Served in Italian Air Force Staff Headquarters as the Head of Doctrine and Future Concepts and led the Joint Strike Fighter F-35 program uh, for the Italian Air Force staff, uh, as well as heading up the Aeronautical Programs Office uh, in, um, uh, in Rome. He served also as Italy's senior national representative at US CENTCOM uh, in Tampa, Florida, before taking up his current position uh, as head of the NATO Southern Hub. Uh, General uh, Ray, uh, over to you. Thank you, David. Thank you uh, very much for a nice, warm introduction. Welcome, everybody. Uh, dear Serge uh, Admiral uh, John Tamman from Allied Command for Transportation, Excellencies that are online, uh, link with us, uh, Professor and distinguished guest participants, ladies and gentlemen, really welcome from uh, the uh, NATO Strategic Direction South Hub uh, here located in Naples. Uh, I let me also uh, just mention uh, some of the very important colleagues and attendees to this important event. Uh, Honorable uh, Musi from Algerian delegation to PAM, Parliamentary Assembly for the Mediterranean. Our friends and colleagues from IPSS uh, in uh, Addis Abeba, Ethiopia. Our friends from uh, African Union in the Peace and Security Operation Division. Uh, Mr. Ka uh, Kawaji from INECMA as a director. Mr. Baroon from the Dubai Policy Center, the booth uh, in uh, uh, in Dubai, of course, uh, uh, my friend, um, engineer Dario Nicolella from APSIA, Miss uh, Koulibaly from ECOWAS, uh, uh, Ambassador Alessandro Minuto Rizzo from the NATO Defense College Foundation, and of course, also the director of the Center of Strategic Analysis and Community of the Portuguese Speaking Language. So welcome, everybody. It's a great pleasure to extend a warm welcome and a really open uh, uh, honor to open the, the webinar along with uh, Admiral uh, John Tamman from ACT uh, in Norfolk on emergency disrupting technologies. And uh, during the last decade, uh, uh, me, mainly the Middle East and North Africa have been described as an area of growing instability uh, with uh, transnational and multinational security challenges. But looking quite closer and with a different approach, the security challenges actually are global and requires new level of shared awareness, flexibility, cross-organizational cooperation and strength and crisis response capability and resilience. In 2016, NATO has committed itself to better understand the Middle East and North Africa and common challenges as disrupting technologies and to assess their applicability in the military domain with the aim to implement them through innovative solutions. With these principles, NATO works in cooperation with the African and Middle Eastern countries to assist in enhancing regional stability and security, facing the same global and common challenges and threats. 
from this cooperative framework and NATO through the, the hub, uh, which I represent along with my colleagues uh, here around me, is eager to announce the sharing understanding on how emergent and disruptive technology may shape the security agenda for everybody. The hub is acting as a virtual docking station for engagement with our partners and friends to enhance comprehensive information sharing, focusing on the challenges and your new opportunities to improve together stability and security. Just remember a few cases, a few practical cases, how Estonia in 2007 was almost, almost completely locked down in one of the first very eye-opening events uh, related to the, a cyber attack. How Daesh, Daesh ISIS, uh, as normally as common called, is still capable to foster its malign narrative through an effective use of social media, fake news, disinformation, and how in September 2019, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia oil pumping station located in Ab Kaik, the Aranko uh, station, was almost uh, massively destroyed by a massive attack sec executed by a wing of unmanned aerial system, about 25 drones and ballistic missiles in accordance with the media. So today is one of the many opportunity events which enables the hub to fulfill one of its main tasks create opportunity to exchange ideas and views on a topical matters of relevance for NATO with its virtual presence today, selected partners. So therefore, ACT and the Hub are co-organizing this event with the aim to bring together experts from all over the world to explore and debate a new and this common challenge, sharing knowledge and the possible best practice to develop options and capability due to its implication on security. From the foundation of common effort, we can work together on identifying changes to contribute to enhancing stability in our societies while exploring further opportunity for cooperation. So David, back to you the floor. Thank you and a welcome again to everybody on this important event. Thank you, sir. And, and thank you to both you and uh, Admiral Tamman for that uh, great uh, introduction. What we're going to do now is get into our first panel, which is focused very heavily on the issue of data. Uh, we're going to be looking at uh, the role of cybersecurity, uh, disinformation, manipulation of data, uh, all as part of a side effect of the massive explosion in electronic connectivity that has occurred across the Middle East and Africa in the last 20 years or so, although uh, it is very patchy depending on which part of that extraordinarily large and diverse region uh, you may happen to find yourself. So to get us started, uh, we're going to have two 20-minute presentations uh, from two experts on those data issues, and then we'll spend another 20 minutes as a group uh, reacting to those uh, comments and discussing uh, the interventions together. So to begin this uh, session, I'd like to invite uh, Professor Aida Mazur uh, to uh, take the floor. Uh, Professor Mazur is an associate professor at the International University of Rabat. Uh, she has a um, background in big data, artificial intelligence and cyber security. She's directed data and artificial intelligence projects relating to employment, uh, which is one of the topics she's going to talk about, uh, along with education, cybersecurity, uh, and social networks. And she's a, a friend of NATO and has worked closely with uh, NATO in the past. She holds a PhD in electrical and computer engineering uh, and in computation organizations and society from Carnegie Mellon uh, University in the US and a master's and bachelor's degree from the Ecole Polytechnique Federale in Lausanne, Switzerland. Uh, she was selected as a rising star by MIT's Electrical Engineering and Computer Science Department in 2015. So Professor Mazur, the floor is yours. So I'll be talking about data-driven emerging technologies in Morocco. And as Admiral Tamman said, so actually the, the goal of my talk, I'll be more talking about the good purpose of how to use technology to increase stability. I see technology as an opportunity. So I cannot talk about security in Morocco 
without talking about a huge human security issue. So in Morocco, it's an extremely young population. Still, more than 20, more than a quarter of the population of these youth are unemployed. And this is even before the crisis, even before the pandemic. During the pandemic, the situation is probably much worse. There is also huge socioeconomic equalities. So there are people who live well, but there are a lot of people who are on the poverty, and there is this huge resentment. And this creates considerable instability, I would say instability, but there are some a lot of tensions in the country. And of course, I have to talk about cybersecurity. Why? Because as David mentioned, the connectivity is increasing. So mobile connectivity is 120, is more than 100 percent More than half the population is active on social media. So there is this huge connectivity. Still, we're ranking very poorly on cybersecurity. We're exposed, but we're not well protected. And in all of this, as any, I mean, decision makers need access to evidence and data to make sound decisions. Still, when people in the US and Europe talk about this explosion of data, Morocco ranks extremely poorly on open data. It's extremely, I mean, raw data is out there on the internet, on social media, on websites, etc. but actual intelligence, it's, it's really scarce. People rely on surveys to collect intelligence, but this is not as powerful as AI or big data can provide, as a lot of experts here in the webinar already know. So now I'll show you some work my group has done on how to use AI to address this employment issue. So I talked about unemployment. One of the issue of unemployment I've actually worked on is the mismatch between the education and the high and the job market needs. So when I told you that 20 youth unemployment is 28% and that's even the pandemic and at the same time, if you talk to the private sector, everybody at the private sector in Morocco complains about skill shortage. Actually, what's going on is not a skill shortage, it's a skill mismatch. And we've done some actually surveys to kind of see whether people are exchanging information about the job market. And that was a survey that was conducted of in three big, three big regions in the country and over three to four years. And the results were always the same. The results were that universities and the private sectors are not exchanging information about the job market. And youth, nobody talks to them. People don't see youth as an important stakeholder. The institutions don't talk to you. They're not getting any information about the job market. At the same time, the survey has also questions about technical and financial support. And here you see that youth are getting information around the public, I mean, not I mean, money from the public sector, from civil society, vocational schools. So my entire life, I thought that getting money was harder than getting information. But this survey actually is showing the opposite. Getting information is actually harder. Which just means that a lot of people in the country complains we're a poor country, if only we could put more money on the problem, we could solve all our problems. That's not the case. The problem is much deeper. So we collected data about, I mean, this is an example of institutions we looked at, we looked at all their reports, everything that they put on their website, their press releases, etc. And we did some word clouds of what they're talking about. So this is in French, I'm not sure everybody can understand. But the idea is that when you see university, they are talking about teaching and research, but they're not talking about employment. And they're talking about students, they're not talking about job seekers. The company is talking about their own products, their own, etc. But they're not talking about job seekers, they're not talking about students, they're not talking about universities. It's only very few institutions who are trying to bridge the gap. So what we witnessed here is that this huge cultural difference, mindset difference, which probably is the one hindering collaboration. So, so we had this issue is that universities don't know what the job market needs. If you ask focuses, they don't know what the job market needs. They know from their friends, but that's very little, that's not evidence. 
So here we started collecting job ads from all the recruitment websites in the country. In a weekly basis, we collect all of them. We did duplicate them using AI and we use a lot of, we developed and use a lot of AI to extract the skills and information from these job ads. And then here I'm just showing you a small example of things we found, but even this was a big information for a lot of people in the country. So here, for example, you see that call centers, there's a lot of call centers in Morocco because we're cheaper and people speak French, etc. So those don't need much education as expected. Automotive industry, so Morocco is starting to become a big hub on automotive, like companies like Renault and Peugeot Citroën have came to Morocco. So here they're needing mainly technicians and few engineers. If you look at the IT and cybersecurity, those need like really higher level education, like actual engineers, because we're doing actual engineering, like brain stuff here in Morocco, which was good. I mean, you could also look at the experience. You could also look at the actual programming languages. For example, you could see that JavaScript and PhD are extremely important in Morocco, but they're not well taught because these are considered to be super easy programming languages. So we informed universities about this finding and we started improving our curricula to adapt to the job market. You could also see soft skills. So soft skills nowadays are extremely important on the job market and in Morocco, Moroccans actually traditionally known to be very good technically, but on the soft skills and the communication skills they're lacking. That's a huge complaint of employers. So we looked at which soft skills are very important. So here, teamwork, communication, analytical skills. We compared that to the US and the findings were actually very different between Morocco and the US, which means that this approach that southern countries sometimes have to just go and find curricula from top foreign universities and adapt it and teach it, that doesn't work for the local context. It's important for the South to start developing things that actually work for them and not just import things exactly the way they are and use them. Again, there were way more results I can point to, to them, but the idea is that, I mean, the goal of this research was not just to publish papers, but we were actually interested in actually having actual change. So we're regularly meeting with the stakeholders, with universities, civil society, students, ministries, and we're sharing our results, we're inviting them to us. And there were lots, we're actually happy because some universities actually adapted their curricula, high government officials, sides with our research and contacted us for follow-up project. And that, and that was cool. Now that was done with employment, I want to talk also about cybersecurity. And I also think that cybersecurity can also be addressed using data-driven approach. Why data-driven approach? Because it's important. First, because when you use evidence to guide decisions, you work on problems that you actually found as important and not just that you think are important. And also when you have data, is you can use AI for prediction. Prediction is very powerful because you can stop things before they actually happen. And even though we're based in Morocco, as I'm going to show you an example, we actually end up doing our research, a lot of work using American data sets. Because again, in the US, in Europe, there's a lot of data that you can use to start doing the prediction work immediately. In Morocco, we did work obviously in Morocco, but that means we had to collect new data sets to start working. Data is still very scarce in Morocco, which is maybe surprising to people in the Western countries. So this is some work we've just done in, in, in Morocco of like this Wi-Fi, this Wi-Fi, is it secure or not? So we did some work, we we're just driving through the streets of Rabat and collecting Wi-Fi signals. And there was good news is that most of them were using encryption. Okay, using encryption doesn't mean it's secure, it's a first step. We also looked at cyber cafes. And again, a lot of people in the US think cyber cafes are over, but in Morocco they're still used because some people have access to the internet through their phones, but they don't necessarily have a computer with internet connection and a printer. And also, this is actually I find something funny, is that Morocco has started to use e-government procedures because supposedly it's easy for people to access all the governmental forms through the internet. But that left a lot of Moroccans, they have no clue how to access the forms and they have no clue how to fill out these forms. 
So the cyber people go to cyber cafes to help them fill out the forms and to help them print the forms, etc. Which means that a lot of private important data is handled in the cyber cafes. They're not just there for games or social media, a lot of super important data is there. So we visited tens of cyber cafes in Morocco, I mean, we interviewed the owners, etc., and we did something as simple as installing an antivirus and see whether they were infected. So more than 60% of them had malware, which is which is very scary. It means people are I mean, Moroccan people are trusting their super important personal data to computers that are infected with malware. We did other work, which is OTX. So, so you may know what's OTX. This is a platform where organizations that kind of see some threat, they go and they report it. So this is kind of a crowdsourced computer security platform. It's the largest in the, in the country, with, in the largest in the world with people participating. So we could see where, how things vary around the world. So obviously countries like the US are much more prominent, but even in Morocco, it, 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 it wasn't bad at all. I mean, there are countries in white, are countries where it is, it was, we didn't find reports from these countries. And then the darker it gets, the means the more I get you get. We also did something where we clustered the countries, we did some clustering based on which countries are getting similar attacks. And here you see some clear geographical proximity. So a lot of, sometimes you talk about cyber attacks as, oh, they cross borders, they don't care about borders. But no, cyber attacks are not just this IT thing. They're also related to people and they're also related to culture. And also, so you kind of see a clear geographical proximity of which countries are getting the same attacks. Again, talking about cyber attacks are not being just a pure technical construct. We did this work, I, I, I find this work pretty cool, but it was done using US data. So in the US, if an if a organization experiences a data breach, they have to report it, which means there are reports of which organizations have experienced a data breach and which organizations did not. So we built a prediction model of how to predict which organization will experience a data breach and which will not. And here we used both technical and social measures. So technical misconfigurations where whether IPs from their institutions are on blacklist or whether they have open ports or whether they're in spam domain. But they also, we also look at how people are talking about this organization on Twitter. Are they saying bad things about them? Are they threatening them? Are they popular on Twitter? And we built a prediction model that looks at both IT and social constructs. So here you could see that we put actually 98% AUAC, which is pretty neat, given that all the data we used was collected externally from the organization. We did not have access to any of this organization's internal data. And another thing that I find pretty neat is that social data contributes with 42%. Again, I remember that cyber attacks are not purely technical constructs. So how people talk about an organization on Twitter, are talking about it a lot, are they threatening it, etc., plays a huge role to see that an organization will experience a data breach. And again, that was the work that we've done in the US and where we think is pretty neat and pretty pretty neat because it's powerful. I mean, you can audit an organization without even having access or talking to the organization. And we'd actually be very interested in adapting it to the Moroccan of African and African context. It would require more work because in, in the US, you can just go and find these huge data sets of organizations, their sector, their IP addresses, etc. There is no online directory of data sets of organizations in Morocco. There is no, I mean, Information is there, but it's in the role. There is no structured data. So there is an effort that needs to be done to collect and structure data. And obviously there is no labeled data on which organizations have experienced data breach and which did not. In Morocco, there is no mandatory requirement for them to report to the public that they've experienced the data breach or any other attacks for that matter. So we, here it needs to use some unsupervised approach. But I think this is very powerful. 
And also, I mean, just to give the talk a little bit more general, because I think the talk is not only about my research, but a bit more general, to give the situation a little bit in Morocco is that in Morocco, the Moroccan search, which is, I think works, I think closely with the NATO, supports organization in strengthening their attacks. There is some mandatory cyber requirements for vital infrastructure. A lot of a number of universities have dedicated cybersecurity programs, like masters or engineering programs. There are a lot, there are a number of Moroccan international companies offering cybersecurity services in Morocco. Some of them are open going to Africa to offer services. And I this topic about fake news, the next speaker is going to talk about fake news even more than me. So this is not backed up by research, this is more my personal things I've seen is that there is a lot of fake news spreading through WhatsApp and Facebook in Morocco. Morocco has, there was a, a, a law, there was a project about a law against fake news, which was extremely controversial because people saw it as trying to curb free speech and there was a huge controversy and that law just disappeared. And yeah, acknowledgement. So a lot of this work was done through the financing of NATO. So I'm very thankful for that. And there's also USA, USID funding for that project. And yeah, so the conclusion is that I think a lot of concerns of Moroccan population right now are issues like social issues, like employment, education, health, social, social inequalities. So I'm going to talk about the security of Morocco as a society. It's really important to address those problems. Now, the cybersecurity, this is human security. And cybersecurity, I think there is mandatory cyber requirements for vital infrastructure, which is good. And in all this, I think there was the discussion about whether AI is used by bad actors or good actors. I think there is a huge opportunity to use AI and data to guide good decisions and to support the people who want to help. Right now, there is little evidence and a lot of people are just, lots of decisions are based on expert opinions. I mean, and, and expert opinions are valuable and surveys are valuable. But there is a huge opportunity to help, to use AI and big data to help, and we have an opportunity to use AI to join alternative data into real-time intelligence. This is done a lot in the US, but not quite yet in Morocco, and I think Morocco needs to get into that as well. So that's the end of my talk. I'm open, I'm happy to take any questions. And we'll thank you actually, again for the invitation. Thank you. We'll actually take, uh, we'll take uh, questions after our next uh, presenter. But thank you for that, Professor Mazur. That was that was uh, fabulous. Um, mobile connectivity, more than half the population on social media, but um, you know, creating a massive attack surface for uh, cybersecurity issues, but people not being prepared. The mismatch between uh, educational systems and the job market need. Uh, this rather scary statistic about uh, the number of cyber cafes that have been infected by malware. Um, when we do get to questions, one that I'd like to ask you um, when the time comes will be, how representative of the rest of Africa do you feel that Morocco is uh, in that respect? Um, but let's build on your last point about um, the issue of fake news and disinformation by going to uh, our next panelist, and he's coming from Amman in Jordan. Uh, Jasser Al-Tahat is a researcher uh, at the Center for Strategic Studies at Jordan University in Amman and at the Institute for Statecraft in London. He's an expert in disinformation and he's been following Russian uh, and Chinese dis disinformation campaigns uh, that are occurring in the Arabic language for several years. Um, he's also a non-staff reporter for The Guardian, uh, The Times UK, and Jasser, I think I've seen your stuff in, in uh, the Jordanian uh, times also, uh, and is a really um, insightful reporter on regional affairs uh, across the Middle East. So uh, Jasser, I know you don't have any slides to share, but I think what you're gonna say uh, will be pretty scary enough um, without that. So uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, uh, Professor David. Thank you for, uh... Dr. Uh, Rita, 
for such an insightful uh, presentation. I'm sorry, as Professor David said, I don't have uh, slides to show, so I guess you are you guys are stuck with this uh, view for the next few minutes. Um, so allow me just to start by saying that this information should not be considered as a technical issue, but rather a strategic challenge. Um, this information is a tool that is designed to infiltrate and further strategic objectives on both public and decision-making levels. It is definitely not a standalone tool, but part of an arsenal uh, designed to uh, target states and businesses uh, without triggering, and this is, I think this is important, without triggering um, aggressive reaction, without, yani, passing that threshold of what is considered to be uh, aggressive uh, action. Um, it makes a perfect tool um, for adversaries due to plausible deni uh, deniability and remote deployment, um, making this information a, a low, low cost, highly effective and low risk um, assault or weapon. This information can also be an indication or an indicator to those who engage in this malign action to point to the strategic objectives that they are trying to pursue uh, throughout this uh, disinformation and influence campaigns. Of course, to better understand the impact of this information, we must take a, a closer look at the media and information sphere in the Middle East. Um, it, is, it, is, it is no secret that the Middle East is a highly sensed, highly polarized, divided region with a lot of tension and to a certain extent um, fragile interstate relations. There's a lot of players in the Middle East. Some are new, some have been historically there. And now we are looking at a, an ecosystem, a media and information ecosystem that lacks the integrity among the uh, Middle East audience. And that is why we, we have identified and we have detected that Middle East audience are turning towards less credible and more disinformation vulnerable platforms and media outlets. And TV and radio channels and media outlets that are usually associated with disinformation and um, influencing operations. The monopoly of the autocratic regimes in the region over the media and mass communications did not stop the average viewer from going to social media or, as I said, to less credible uh, media outlets, making the Middle East a very fertile soil for a, mag a magnified impact of disinformation campaigns and influencing campaigns. It is safe to say here that over the past few years, um, anti-Western powers, if, if, yeah, I think that's accurate to say, anti-Western narratives have been gaining a lot on the Western narrative in the region. I mean, if we just look at the numbers of um, increased followership, and viewership of newly established Arabic language channels, we would see that they have surpassed uh, Western channels that have been broadcasting and that have been um, a main source of information to the majority of uh, audiences in the Middle East. Um, with that in mind, we need to take a look at as I said, the, the audience in the Middle East are turning to social media, they are turning to uh, less credible media outlets. They are more vulnerable to be subjected to disinformation and engage wittingly or unwittingly in uh, influencing campaigns and influencing operations. So recently over the past few years, the, the, the term um, internet assault forces, I've read this term a few times and I think it, it describes best how states and non-state actors can take part 
remotely with uh, plausible deniability with a low cost uh, and the low effort to influence the public perception and public opinion on either domestic and interstate matters, it can affect a society and erode social cohesion, economics, and the trust in state capacity. And this is quite frightening, to be honest, because we have also seen that these internet assault forces or the, the use of bots on social media or how disinformation campaigns and certain narratives have been supporting radical and extreme ideologies and narratives to create some sort of a bubble and false support for those who believe it, inciting them to take further action, thinking that they have um, for uh, thinking that they have support, wide support, while they don't. But yet, this action is actually affecting uh, social cohesion and the stability of states and countries in the region. Um, on the other hand, we, we, we see that this information has also been used to strip rational opposition movements uh, from its legitimacy uh, through various narratives, whether it's just peaceful demonstrations going um, anywhere in the world or uh, sorry, in the region or um, any rational sort of opposition is usually you know, is usually subjected to disinformation campaigns to strip this movement or narrative from its legitimacy and just expose it in front of the public opinion as something of a malign influence. Of course, I, I, I need to say that this this sort of activity and marginalizing. Um, peaceful and rational opposition movements and narratives can only lead to more drastic measures taken by these opposition groups. It, it just enhances the sentiment of um, not, not only failure, but it makes an enemy out of somebody who's not, basically. Now, I'm going to just go, go through a few examples on how this information uh, feature uh, served strategic objectives. And I would just go back um, to, uh, was it, I think March 2020, yeah, just last March, we saw an unusual campaign that targeted uh, Syria and, and specifically the head of state, President Bashar al-Assad. In March 2020, we saw a few reports published by media outlets, Russian media outlets, that are associated with the Internet Research Agency, the infamous Internet Research Agency, it's talking about how um, President Assad does not enjoy widespread uh, uh, approval rates, or that he's a, he is the main problem of the Syrian economy, or that he's a headache for Russia and Russia intervention in Syria. And I'm sure most of you may have seen that headline that Assad is a headache. And so shortly after those, those reports were published, we saw wide engagement and wide interactions from various and different regional and international media outlets that took part in this campaign, knowingly or in, whether they knew that this was part of a campaign or not. But this was major headlines to, to actually just Publish, upon, uh, publish in, publish in, in, in media. So a few weeks after that, we picked up on other media outlets from the region in Lebanon, in Iran, in Syria itself, uh, in Jordan, um, talking about how this is um, just a, you know, a stir, just a, something blown out of proportion. It's nothing, things are going so well. During that time, we saw how President Assad ousted his cousin, Mr. Rami Makhlouf. Um, and only a few weeks after that, President Putin appointed uh, Syria's ambassador as his uh, special envoy to Syria to negotiate new deals and new agreements with the Syrian government. Now, this, this so over the course of, of two months, that's it, two months, March to May, we saw the start of a campaign, we saw reactions from 
countries in the region. We saw reactions from uh, Syrian opposition in, uh, in, in, in out, out, outside Syria. And then we saw President Putin uh, appointing his special envoy, his new special envoy, and then new agreements were signed, paving the way for Russian businessmen into the Syrian economy and for Russia to expand its military presence in Syria. Now, this, I just sit and think, could this be related? And in my opinion, I think it is, because I believe that this campaign was launched against Assad just to put him under pressure and show him that maybe we are not happy and that you need to submit to further uh, requests and demands from us. Of course, I just need to say that um, when, when this was picked up by other media outlets, those two Russian media outlets that initiated this campaign came out to say that we were hacked and we had nothing to do with it and we never said that. So another, another sort of evidence of how um, disinformation campaigns led by relatively new narratives introduced to the region have been targeting, um, as I said, rational, nonviolent, opposition narratives and movements. Um, and, and with this one, I'm going to trace back to 2019, uh, late, late 2019, and take into, you know, take into vision uh, both Iraq and Lebanon here. And just uh, as the two countries saw demonstrations, uh, whether for economic or social demands, we saw two narratives that were widely circulated. Uh, among social media and among uh, Russian media outlets and Chinese media outlets, stipulating that these two, any these demonstrations, are not spontaneous. They are uh, an outcome of foreign influence. They are an outcome of malign intention, and they are harming the economy. They are disrupting um, the uh, basically the delivery of basic commodities to people who are poor, people who are in need. Now, we, 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 we sit back and look, why? And during this time, during the late 2019, and when, when, when demonstrators, demonstrators were being shot in Iraq, we saw the Iraqi ambassador to Russia visiting RT's offices and saying that we need to expand the cooperation between the media outlets in Iraq and the media outlets in Russia to reflect the truth about what's happening in Iraq. So the truth now is no longer what, what is factual. It is no longer what is happening on the ground. The truth is what is stipulated and what is mostly uh, believed to be. Um, I'm gonna take another, another example uh, about this, this sort of, of uh, contradiction and, and some sort of this sort of denying truth and, and debating facts. The use of chemical weapons, for instance, in Syria, it is now being debatable. It is, this, not, it is not only a, a, a result of disinformation campaigns on media outlets, but also disinformation narratives that have been circulated among second track diplomat, diplomats and then think tanks and Russian officials also. Um, as I said, the shooting of demonstrators in Iraq, there, there was a hugely circulated narrative on social media and on Russian uh, media outlets saying that those people were shot by a third party who just wants to inflame the situation and just pour fuel uh, oil on, on fire. Even the operation that resulted in Baghdadi's death is now being disputed whether the Americans were actually telling the truth or not. Um, and this is quite yeah, amusing to be very honest, yet quite dangerous because the integrity, not only of the Western narrative, but information and facts is being harmed. The perception of what is true and what is not is, is, is at, yeah, I mean, is exposed, it's vulnerable, it's fragile. The basis of truth is fragile. And in a country, in, in, in a region like the Middle East, this information campaign not only can impact violence and, and erode the social cohesion, the cohesion, as I said, but also lead to major and deep conflicts between states. Now, 
this is all disinformation campaigns and influencing operations that have been taking place on social media and some media outlets. Um, but let's let's just make things a bit more scary and, and include AI into this and just say, uh, so what are we looking at? Of course, bots are being used in disinformation and, influ and, and influencing operations. But I mean, uh, it is, it is just frightening how AI can mimic uh, human interaction and, and human produced content in the sense that uh, it, it, it could just magnify and multiply not only the flow of disinformation and the, the amount of campaigns and the, 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 the reach of these campaigns, but also of how real it can seem to the average viewer. Um, I'm gonna like that, that. I'm gonna imagine a scenario with you here, and then just bear with me on this one. In a country like Iraq, highly divided, sectarian divided, conflict torn, a deep fake video emerges on social media and is being circulated on WhatsApp of a Sunni cleric, for instance, insulting Shia religious figures, and a few hours after that, we see another deep, deep fake video um, of people in arms shooting and then wreaking havoc in a Shiite uh, area. And you, you, maybe for, for, for most of the people present here and listening, they could be able to tell or at least question for a second that maybe this is fake. But for the average user, who is most probably will be taking arms, up in arms and then shooting, they might not think twice. Another, another uh, example. Let's just imagine a head of state, prime minister uh, from the region, a deep fake video of him in some indecent uh, position is being circulated on, on, on social media, on WhatsApp and on social media. How, how, how would that impact the integrity and the legitimacy of this person? With that in mind, you can only imagine and then only mm, yeah, and you try to anticipate the magnitude and the damage that could be done if AI was to make it into state, let's say marginal states and non-state actors. The, the amount, the spectrum of narratives and the targets are, is, is, is just massive. And it, I don't think there's, a, there's any way to anticipate how AI can target anybody or how it will or who it would target next with, with the deep fake technology. Um, AI could also be, I mean, AI could, could, could see the, 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 the automation of propaganda. Um, in a region of mostly autocratic regimes, not only are we looking at uh, AI fueled or AI, uh, an, an application of AI that uh, yeah, uh, furthers uh, surveillance and, and uh, repression and oppression of, of citizens, but also of uh, automated propaganda that is not only targeting domestic uh, audiences, but also it could target foreign uh, societies to actually just spread whatever narrative is best for a certain actor or power. So it could be a state and, and a non-state actor. It could be both and it could be one, it could be the other. And I know, I know this seems pretty grim, and I know that it, this, this all seems pretty um, hopeless. But I think that not only do we have a good margin to find a solution, not only that we have um, a good chance to actually counter the 
this, this Malayan uh, action and, and influence. But we need to take a different look at, at this information as a concept. Because I don't think that we can keep putting disinformation, misinformation, fake news and propaganda in the same category. We need to deal with each and every one of them according to different rules and, 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 and engagement and engagement rules. Because if we, if we keep thinking that fact checking, um, did, did I go off of time? You got about one minute left, so you're good. Oh, okay, good, good. Uh, so I'm, I'm just finishing up. If we keep thinking that um, fact checking will do the job of combating this information and, and false information, this will only keep us on the back foot. We will always be playing catch up with any disinformation or influencing operation. Also, if we believe that policing social media so that citizens can't publish or uh, write up or express themselves in the sense that they, they feel that is representative to them, we will only see them taking much more drastic measures to hide their identity, which is now very commercial uh, and, and easy to, to use. Uh, and, and, and just get off the grid. Not get off the grid in the sense that they will stop using the, uh, social media, but get off the grid in the sense that their identity is completely hidden. Um, we just need to look at this information, as I said, as a strategic issue, not a technical one. And I don't want to go over time. Sorry if I did. Uh, apologies and apologies if I bored you guys. Thank you, Jasso. You're not, not boring at all. In fact, quite, uh, quite scary. Um, the technical team uh, has advised us that we're having some trouble with attendees uh, connecting on this link. Uh, Jesse, would you like to give us some instructions about migrating to another link? Sure, yeah, and apologies for this. Uh, we actually have most of our audience members on YouTube right now um, as we deal with this technical uh, issue. So I was going to recommend that we migrate over to another link, which will be uh, shared shortly. And Dr. Kukulun, I think it's up to you. Would you like to pause now and take our 10 minute break? Or do you have a few questions to pose to the panelists? I think I'd like to have the opportunity for the audience to participate. And I do have uh, questions for the panelists, but let's take a, a 10 minute break. Let's reconvene okay. on the new link, if you could send that out. And then when we come back, I'm going to be asking Professor Mazur about that question about how representative uh, Morocco is of the rest of Africa. And I'm going to ask uh, Mr. Tahat a question about uh, AI driven influence campaigns, which you were talking about, and whether there's a, uh, a relationship between online manipulation of narratives and physical demonstrations and protests uh, in the real world. And we'll start with those questions uh, and then start to take some more from the audience. So let's pause here uh, and reconvene in 10 minutes from now on the new link. Thanks to everybody for um, bearing with us as we transitioned from uh, our previous link to this one. We're going to reconvene uh, with the discussion from the first panel. And uh, I'd like to start with Professor Mazur, who gave a, gave a really good overview of the situation in Morocco with respect to data inequality, uh, AI, the greatly increased attack surface for uh, cybersecurity. And my question to her is how uh, representative of the rest of Africa does she feel that Morocco is? So Professor Mazur, the floor is yours if you'd like to answer that. Okay, so for Morocco is very representative of the north of Africa. Like we're very similar stories. You find Morocco, Algeria, Tunisia, and we're very similar culturally, historically, IT-wise. A lot of our stories are similar. Now, Morocco likes to position itself as being the hub to Africa, and it started its relationship with Africa just a few years ago. I think historically. <laughs> Difficult. Okay, I would say we're very representative of North of Africa. With Africa, we bear some similarities, but it's not exactly the same story. 
I think the, 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 the huge Sahara between us and North and Africa means that we had different ways of coming. Yeah. And you mentioned earlier that there's some significant uh, differences in connectivity just within Morocco, right? And I, do you think that that's one of the key factors here? I mean, maybe it's a protective factor for countries to have less connectivity. What do you think about that idea? People are... I'm not sure. I, 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 I think people are not connected to the internet because they cannot afford it. In Morocco, actually, internet connectivity is pretty cheap. So I, I pay less for my internet connection than when I was living in the US, keeping in mind that the cost of life, the difference in cost of life between Morocco and the US is huge. Here, internet connectivity is it's pretty cheap. I think it's affordable. And there are even plans for even just social media. So you can find a plan just for social media, which is even cheaper than the general internet. Mm -hmm. I think, in, and also the fact that there isn't much infrastructure, a lot of internet, I think this is also in Africa, a lot of internet is happening through mobile and through satellite, not through the in infrastructure because it's much cheaper to deploy. So I think this is in whole Africa, the mobile growth is across whole Africa. Mm. But Thank the you. difference is, I, I don't know if I can show you a map here, so I can, I, I, I brought up this map while we were talking, let me see if I can bring it up. I don't know if you can share with me the screen so I can show you the map of mm -hmm. a mobile community. Just can we give uh, Professor Mazur the screen? Yeah. Yeah, so you can see, I was say, this is just one mobile connectivity. Again, there are a lot of other measures, but you can see that we're very similar with North Africa. You can see mobile connectivity a lot in South Africa, but again, in the middle, there is a lot of variation. Mm. Great. Well, thank you for that, and I'm sure we'll get into that a little more with with the uh, with the webinar audience. Uh, Jasser, if you're still there, can you tell us a little bit about this question about the relationship between online manipulation? and real world protest movements. One of the things we see in Africa, actually and in Latin America and elsewhere is manipulation and mobilization of uh, mass protest groups, in some cases using uh, online methodologies. I was very struck by your point that uh, even though the Russians were officially backing the Assad regime in, in Syria, they were also using uh, internet manipulation as a way to pressure uh, Bashar al-Assad uh, as an adjunct to diplomacy, if you like. So maybe you could pick up some of those issues and then after that we'll go to the to the audience questions. Yeah, uh, can you hear me? Yep. Okay, so let, let me just point to, to one of your remarks just now. Uh, I think the the campaign against uh, Bashar, uh, any president of Syria, Bashar al-Assad, uh, is not only, uh, and it did not you and he wasn't using online exclusively, but also integrated to uh, our, our shifted to uh, traditional media and news platforms and news websites and social media. So it, it wasn't a, a campaign of, in my opinion, it was a campaign of manipulation. It was a campaign of pressure. Those are the two factors that uh, uh, that uh, I believe that campaign was was aiming at. Uh, regarding your question of um, AI driven uh, or AI driven narratives and how it influences uh, protests and, and movements on the ground, I think there's a there's a very very uh, good or uh, solid correlation between the two in the sense that, as I said, AI will soon be able to mimic, if not already mimic. Um, human-made uh, content, and with that in mind, the, 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 we can Im only imagine how the flow and, and the magnitude of AI-produced content that is fairly similar or very similar to human content can influence protests and groups, especially those who are already in action. So not in the sense of uh, mobilizing the, the masses to take part, but once those take part and once the situation reaches critical levels of tension, I think there will be very solid correlation between what is published and 
what is happening on the ground. Does that answer your question? Yes, it does, Jesse. Yeah, that's that's a great point. Um, and uh, I think that actually is a good segue into the uh, the first question from the audience, um, which comes from Ahmed Ali. Uh, you know, we we don't only see these issues of divided narratives and polarized populations and external interference in the Middle East and North Africa. We see it in Europe and in North America and a variety of other places. And Ahmed Ali's question is, you know, to what extent does emerging uh, and disruptive tech in the Middle East and North Africa region, or actually Middle East and Africa, how could we consider that to be a threat to NATO? Um, and uh, what can NATO provide or offer to um, countries in, in those regions in practical terms? And I defer to, to both our panelists from the first session. Um, Justin, maybe you'd like to start um, and perhaps offer some thoughts on that question. So to what extent is these technologies disruptive and, and how can be the utilized? And to what extent is it a threat to NATO in particular? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna just give an example here of a uh, Russian campaign related and originating uh, campaign originating originating from Russia connected to the Wagner group that was supporting and promoting Qaddafi's uh, Libya and supporting uh, his son, Saif al Islam Qaddafi, as a political actor and a legitimate uh, leader for this uh, country. So, in that, with that in mind, we are seeing this information that are backing actors who might be hostile towards NATO or who might be, uh, who might consider NATO as an enemy in the sense that um basically nato nato is 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 not serving uh, do not share uh shared uh, goals and objectives not only that but we can also see these disruptive and destructive narratives um basically promoting nato not only as an enemy as and 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 the force of malign influence but also as a force of destabilization of a country in the sense that um, we need to fight this new power coming into the region. Um, what can NATO do? I think NATO can do a lot, but NATO must take into consideration the, con the different contexts of countries in the region, in the, in the Middle East and North Africa region. Because if, if NATO were to integrate to support the state, in fighting this information and these, uh, or at least limit and mitigate the effects of this, uh, these uh, destructive tools, they need to work within the mechanisms that are already applied in, in, in each country. So I don't think NATO can have a system that could be integrated across the region as a whole, but it could have different mechanisms and different cooperation uh, points and, and programs to each and every uh, country. So I don't think what NATO can do, there's one answer to that, but there are many with that, uh, with that in mind. But there's a lot that they can do. I mean, uh, the, it seems to me that in the region, the topic of disinformation always resonates to more policing which is which in my opinion in my humble opinion i think that is that is a very false uh, approach to this uh, to face uh, this 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 problem um thanks jasser and i think that's actually quite relevant to something that professor mazur was saying um earlier um Rita, do you do you want to talk a little bit about this question of yeah the relationship yeah. between nato yeah so I talked about this disinformation. I, I mentioned very quickly, I mean, just I talked way more than me about disinformation. But what I saw about disinformation happening in Morocco, it, I didn't see it much military or against other countries. Most of this information I saw in Morocco was like there was this huge campaign about boycott. They were trying to boycott some products. And after, there were some oil company, there was some yogurt company. They had this huge boycott. 
thing. And there's a lot of fake information. Like some of the stuff the companies actually do, a lot of it did not do. Some of the other things were a lot of fake information was about some governmental policy, about some society, oh, this government official stole money, this government official is corrupt, this there was a lot of fake information about this crime, or oh, this girl got kidnapped when she did not get kidnapped. I did not in Morocco see this information like similar to what Jassar was talking about. So is it a threat to the NATO? Maybe I, I maybe I don't see the whole fake information sphere in Morocco, but the things I've been seeing were not military. And Talking, another thing I see as problem is cybercrime. I know there is NATO is also already collaborating with Moroccans. I mean, cybercrime in Morocco is, if there's a problem in cybersecurity in Morocco it, or in Africa, it's a problem in the world because a lot of hackers, they go through infected computers and they use these infected computers to infect others. So this is, I mean, the world is so interconnected. So if anywhere in the world, becomes a cybersecurity hub for criminals or state actors, et cetera, it's, it can be used as a vector. So it's very, it, it's very important for the NATO, I think, to protect itself against those. And of course, I mean, I, I know that this employment issue and this unemployment is probably not on the top of the NATO, but I like to bring it up. Again, if there is a lot of social unrest, a lot of unemployment, a lot of people want to migrate abroad, and that creates tensions on the receiving countries if they're starting to receive a lot of illegal immigrants. So that's mm -hmm. the threats I see. Thanks. And we'll get back to that, I think, in the, in the next question. I would just offer a couple of comments. One would be that we already know that there's a close relationship between NATO security and security in Africa and the Middle East in the real world. I mean, we saw this yeah. in the aftermath of the Arab Spring and the 2015 crisis in Syria, which pretty quickly led to uh, a refugee crisis in Europe and a whole series of uh, political destabilization. So there's clearly a, a, a close linkage. Um, and I think as, as uh, Professor Mazur just said, it, it's even closer in the cybersecurity uh, domain. The, mm -hmm. In terms of what NATO can offer to countries, the thing that jumps out at me is the fact that NATO has been focusing a lot on the resilience agenda over the last several years. And one of the elements of resilience that NATO has identified as a baseline requirement is civil communications. And there's a lot in there, which I think um, the work that NATO has done to think about uh, those issues is probably pretty relevant to partners and friends uh, in the region. Um, Professor Mazur, let me come back to you with the next question from the audience. They're asking how emerging technologies can be used as an opportunity to uh, to deal with the youth bulge that's coming to Africa uh, and to organize movements in the region with respect to democracy and development. I think that relates very clearly to the first few points that you made. So can I ask you to comment on that? Yeah, I think, I mean, AI is, people are scared of AI, but there's this huge movement of AI for good and AI for stability is that youth, I mean, a lot, of, I mean, the stigma that Arab youth are all having this kind of weapon and trying to attack is not true. A lot of youth in Morocco or North Africa, they, they, they want a job, they want economic opportunities, they want to start their well, starting businesses that continue to get there, they just want to have a decent life. If you give them a decent life, they're not interested in crime or weapon. And I think if if they can get this opportunity, and they think I think it's very important. And so one way, this is not the only way, but one way is to kind of show them this opportunity. Again, coming back to this thing that they're not aware of opportunities, they're not aware of good cases. So one simple idea was just to showcase successful people who maybe went from a poor background and were able to succeed, showcase the positive energy. There's a lot of negative energy in Morocco, a lot of youth that think that even if they work, they would never succeed. So just show them some positive energy. Give them information about opportunities. Again, there's a lot, like data is not shared in Morocco. Even within the same administration, they would not share data. And nothing I can do about it. It's culture is very difficult to change, but but technology is actually much easier to change. So there's a lot of raw data that's out there on the internet, on social media, on websites. AI 
can turn this data into economic intelligence, social intelligence, help interventions, show them the economic opportunities, bring the investors and give them jobs. I think that's what the, the North African youth wants. I mean, the Arab Spring, which was this huge movement, I mean, it happened, it, it started because a Tunisian guy did lose his jobs. So jobs are really this super critical issue in Morocco and North Africa. Thank you for that. Um, so final question before we go to the next panel. Um, and I'm going to direct this one to, to Jasso. It's a question about deep fakes. And uh, the audience are asking, you know, you, it was mentioned that deep fakes can cause societal divisions and even make people uh, take up arms. And, you know, obviously that's a pretty scary scenario. Uh, so as technology uh, and um, uh, AI develops, what kind of strategies do you think are open to states to address the issue of infiltration of defects? And is there a long-term strategy to think about? Well, I think that's a very, very good question. Um, I, I, I believe that to think that you can stop the advance the advancement of technology and the development of technology would be naive. And in the history of technological advance has, has shown that what is considered advanced now is would not be considered adva as, as, as advanced later on. With that in mind, and, and when we see how technology just jumped and, and took leaps to advance and to make things more possible and to make things more uh, available, it also took leaps in advance towards some, to, towards a bad aspects or prospects. So in this region, I don't think that the region still comprehends how dangerous this is and whether, I mean, or how they're gonna deal with it. And thinking that they can stop its infiltration to societies and stop its uh, applications and its malign uh, influence in societies and just barrier block it, I think that would be naive because it will always find a way to to some 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 hands that will make use of it and they will make either the best or the worst of it. Is that a strategy? I don't think so. Um, and the approach must not be, it is crucial that the approach is not that, okay, we are going to ban defects. That's not how, how, how it works. This simply doesn't work. Okay, so we're policing anyone who uses defake will be thrown in jail for 10 years. That's not how it's gonna work. Defake will find a way. It will infiltrate society. It will find its way to certain uh, experts or technicians or uh, those who will use it for good and bad. And it will have an impact. It definitely will have an impact. It would definitely have a negative and a positive impact. But I don't think the region still, and I don't think the region has a strategy to face this or to deal with it. Thanks, Josh. So that's a, that's a great point and actually quite a, quite a scary one. Um, so I want to reassure the audience, we're going to have our uh, opportunity in the, the third session for open discussion. And if you didn't get to ask your question in this first panel, there'll be an opportunity in, in, in the uh, networking session at the end. What we're gonna do now is go to uh, our second panel. And uh, that panel is focusing on autonomy, space and cyber and a related series of issues uh, in the region. And uh, joining us for that panel, uh, Professor Sid Ahmed Ben Rouhan, uh, who's uh, based in the UAE, but is also a professor at the University of Minnesota, and uh, Dr. Greg Mills, who is the head of the Brenthurst Foundation based in Johannesburg. Uh, I'm gonna ask uh, Dr. Mills to go first in uh, the next session. Let me give you his background. Uh, he's educated at the universities of Cape Town uh, and Lancaster, uh, taught at a number of uh, UK and uh, South African institutions. He was the director of studies at the South African 
Institute for International Affairs and then uh, became the national director uh, of that very prestigious institute. He served in Rwanda uh, as an advisor to the president of Rwanda. Uh, he's served uh, in Malawi uh, and a number of other African countries as a very high level advisor. He's very well known to NATO people though, uh, because of his role uh, as part of the strategic analysis group known as uh, PRISM within uh, the ISAF team in Kabul. Uh, and he deployed twice to Afghanistan uh, to support uh, NATO and ISAF efforts uh, in, in that country. He's very widely published on uh, international affairs, development, <clears throat> security. He's a regular uh, columnist for South African and international newspapers. And I will not actually list uh, all of his best-selling books because there are just so many of them uh, that it'll take us uh, the entire time. So um, with that, I'd like to uh, recommend uh, that you uh, uh, listen very closely to what he has to say uh, about the area of emerging and disruptive technology in uh, the Middle East and Africa. So Greg, I'm gonna throw to you. I believe you have some slides to share also. Uh, yes, thank you very much. Can you hear me okay? Got you, yeah. Uh, well, good afternoon, everybody from uh, from Athens, uh, um, uh, where I'm currently on a, on a brief fellowship. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be with you. I'm going to whistle through some slides in my allotted 20 minutes. There may be a, a little bit of overlap with what you've already heard, but I want to really do two things. The first is to provide some context to what this what we're talking about uh, when we describe the African environment, the African milieu, uh, and the environment in which these technologies are taking root or may take root uh, in particular shapes and forms in the future. Um, do I have control of the... Uh, no, I don't. It doesn't seem like it. Uh, can, we, uh, can we give Greg presenter control? Uh, it doesn't look like... Anyway, uh, next one. Yeah, next. Next slide. There we go. So just, uh, there seems to be a lag. Uh, just very briefly, if you just go back to the second slide and show it in toto, please. Thank you very much. Uh, just very briefly, the, the foundation that I work for, um, it spends much of its time, as, as the chair has mentioned, uh, advising African governments at their request. So although we do public work, uh, as David has illustrated, um, we mostly spend our time trying to find the strategies or develop the strategies to get economies growing faster and in a more diversified fashion. So that's really my starting point in this discussion. Next, please. Next. And what I have to say today is really based on uh, those three books which have now come and gone. <laughs> um, uh, and, uh, uh, and, and obviously the world for us, as it is for you, has been shaped tremendously uh, by the developments of COVID. Next, please. And again. Thank you. And, and, and just from the outset, let me say that there are six major trends uh, from an African vantage and the way in which we see COVID. Obviously, the first of these is what's going to happen to the way in which the world has worked up, up until now. What's this going to mean for growth? What's this going to mean for uh, the opportunities for diversification, for investment flows, and so on. Next, please. Next. The second of these is, of course, uh, this issue of technology. Uh, we know now from COVID and indeed in this, in this video conference that we're in, how important technology and data is. Uh, Africa is relatively far behind the rest of the world in terms, and I'm talking particularly here about Sub-Saharan Africa. You've had a speaker a moment ago talking about North Africa. Um, Sub-Saharan Africa especially uh, is behind the rest of the world with about 25% access in terms of internet connectivity uh, with very high costs. Also, 
which are a mitigating factor. Next, please. Uh, uh, the relationship with government and their citizens. Uh, Africa is characterized by relatively uh, slowly uh, improving governance conditions. Um, and I'll come back to the, the, uh, the graphic on the right-hand side of this particular slide. Um, and the question for many of us is, is to what extent COVID and the emergencies are going to change the relationship between citizens and allow for greater authoritarianism. Next, please. Uh, it also has had an impact on human security and on migration patterns. We're not anywhere near the peak that we were in 2015, but I think it would be fair to expect that you're going to see an increase in the pressure, uh, in the push factors uh, from Africa related uh, increasingly to food security and, of course, related to demographics, which I'll come back to in a second. Next, please. Um, the impact of this on health uh, as the new wealth uh, um, and the way in which uh, government and both people respond to this uh, um, and the value of this as an economic resource is also going to impact on the way in which governments respond uh, uh, and also the way in which their people respond to them. Next, please. And finally, um, the big question for us, uh, as we struggle for relatively equitable access in the global economy, is where are we going in terms of the consumers of the future? Are we going to see consumerism continue post-COVID uh, in order for Africa to be able to play, play its to take its rightful place uh, as a proportional share of the global economy. Next, please. Next. So if we had to pick um, six big questions for Africa going forward, uh, these would really, really be, how are we going to increase economic growth in Africa to get up to around the levels that Asia has, has maintained consistently for, the, consistently for the past 30 years of around 8%, because we need to do that to be able to provide for the second factor, which is that of significant demographic change, with Africa doubling its population over the next generation. And the real question here is how do we equip young people properly to be able to ensure a demographic dividend? Most of those young people are going to be in our cities. Um, most Africans are going to be living in cities from 2030. How do we get to plan better for this and enjoy the sort of economies of scale that densification offers? The fourth big question for Africa is, of course, the one that we're discussing today, which is the issue about technology. Uh, how do we use technology to our advantage while uh, reducing the unemployment downsides uh, of increasing uh, commercialization and intensification of technological developments uh, and the closing off of certain avenues uh, for growth and for employment creation. Uh, and, and the real question for us is what sort of businesses are going to be able to prosper in a world characterized uh, by increasing digitization? Um, this has profound intersections uh, with democracy and governance. We know, and I'll come back to this in a second, that democracies do much better at governance and at growth overall in Africa. There's a strong correlation between demographic, sorry, de democratic conditions and growth. But uh, how do we institutionalize democracies? Because they're much more than about elections. Elections are a good place to start. But how do we institutionalize these processes remains a moot point. And then finally, how can outsiders help in all of this? Because we haven't seemingly learned the lessons of the last 50 years, or at least those lessons haven't stuck. Next, please. Next. And I'm going to go through this very quickly. Uh, as I've said, we're going to double our population over the next uh, 50 years. Sorry, over the next 25 years. Next, please, by 2050. Uh, half of, uh, about 80% of this increase is going to be in our cities. African cities are going to be around 
uh, the same population size by 2050 that all of Africa is today. Next, please. Uh, and this has a link, as I've said, with political transitions and democracy. Next, please. Uh, there's been a significant change in Africa over the last 20 years. Uh, most African countries in 1990, so the last 30 years, sorry, uh, could be regarded in terms of freedom houses classification as not free. Here yeah, I characterized in the dark shade. Uh, today, uh, um, the number of not free and partly free countries. Next, please. This has seen a significant reduction in the number of coups. Next, please. And this is important for some of the reasons that I've already mentioned. Next, please. The first reason why it's important is that the majority of Africans, and this is these are regular polls conducted by Afrobarometer, prefer democracy to any other form of govern government. And the reason why they do this is, of course, because they deliver better. Um, a civilian uh, uh, rulers may be incompetent in some cases, but they're less incompetent, if I can invoke, invoke a double negative, uh, than their military counterparts. I'm sorry to say for the military members of this audience, uh, particularly in Africa. So uh, two thirds of Africans prefer democracy to any other form of government. And it's been a hard won victory in most cases that they don't want taken away from them next. It also is important because democracies and the better the democracy is characterized here by the green line of the free countries uh, as classified by Freedom House tend to do much better uh, than their uh, partly free and unfree counterparts. Next, please. And of course, this should not come as no secret because there's a link to governance. Next. Uh, the freer country, the freer the countries, the more open they are. Next. Uh, the more transparent they are. Next. Uh, and the more effective judicial systems they have in Africa. So we shouldn't really be surprised uh, that they tend uh, to develop faster and enjoy the compounding effects of growth better than their more authoritarian counterparts. Next, please. Africa's growth, however, has been relatively poor by global standards. Next, please. In uh, early 2000, the continent was described as hopeless by The Economist. Next. Ten years later, it was described as the continent was, that was rising. And of course, as ever, the truth lies in both those descriptions, but also in many stages in between. Some countries are hopeless, some are rising, and some are battling it out in the middle. Uh, but overall, next please. Africa's growth performance by comparison uh, to those of countries of Southeast Asia, for example, and this is per capita GDP has been poor. And essentially, if you look at the period from 1975 uh, to around 2000, we lost 25 years of economic growth through mismanagement, low commodity prices, uh, military coup d'etats, declining conditions of governance, and so on, while the rest of the world <clears throat> grew at much higher rates and got on. Next, please. And you see this particularly in terms of the difference between Asia and Africa as a percentage of share of world GDP per capita. So at, in, uh, at 1960, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa's average was about 25%, that nearly 30% of the global average. Uh, that in, in ASEAN was around 50%. Today, it's over 120%, nearly 130% in ASEAN of the global average in Africa has declined to under 20%. Next, please. And this, of course, all of this relates to education and skills. Next, please. 
Africa's primary school enrollment rates have improved substantially over the last 40 years, uh, but they, particularly in terms of completion, still remain well below, well below the rates of the rest of the world. Next, please. And this situation is even worse when we look at tertiary enrollment rates. Next, please. We also remain relatively undiversified. We remain commodity dependent and very vulnerable to wide and wild fluctuations in commodity prices. Next, please. Uh, most African countries, despite a considerable advantage in terms of agriculture, are net uh, agricultural importers. Uh, very few of them are exporters, as portrayed here by the light shade. Next, please. And this is a consequence of us really not enjoying the sorts of technological revolution that led to a green revolution uh, in many areas of the world, notably in South Asia in the 1960s and 70s. And the, the blue line is cereal yields by hectare uh, in sub-Saharan Africa. Next, please. And this relates to the irrigation of arable land. We have the, the light shade in this bar chart. Next, please and also use of fertilizer, uh, which is well below uh, the, the global average uh, and indeed the global norm, uh, and indeed the targets that Africa has set itself of 50 kilograms per hectare in terms of fertilizer and uh, nutrients. Next, please. But there are lots of positives, and many of these positives are about what technology can offer us. Next, please. We have a young population. Uh, we are more energetic uh, than other parts of the world simply by dint of our age. As the rest of the world is getting older, uh, um, we, are, uh, we have a population whose average age is around 20. Next, please. And as uh, our birth rates come down, hopefully, um, and as these, this, this youthful body of people in our societies are translated into uh, uh, job seekers and workers, you'll see dependency ratios fall uh, considerably in Africa while they increase in the rest of the world because of an increase in the number proportionately of older people. Next, please. Our urban population rate is increasing steadily. As I've said, that has advantages in terms of the delivery of services and agglomeration of people to work in uh, meaningful economic ways. Next, please. Um, our access to housing has been very low, uh, in part because of the access to housing loans and the revolution in banking across Africa is quite quickly changing this picture. Next, please. And similarly, uh, Africa remains, most of Africa remains uh, uh, powerless in terms of access to electricity. Uh, um, again, the development of microgrids and other payment methods uh, for national grids is fast changing this and offers all sorts of previously unavailable avenues. Next, please. Similar, similarly, the same can be said for potable water. All of this facilitated to a great extent by commercial uh, investment. Next, please. Uh, cost of logistics in Africa remains very high. One of the reasons for this is not tariffs so much as simply uh, the difficulties of crossing borders and the digitalization of uh, cargo manifests and uh, port clearance uh, procedures is certainly helping and East Africa is a great case study in this regard. Next. And of course, we've already discussed this, but internet and telephony penetration has transformed Africa from being the cut-off continent in the mid-1990s to really being a continent that is connected with itself more than anything else. So people don't have to literally travel days across territories to go and speak to someone who can pick up your mobile phone. Next, please. And this has improved uh, particularly financial institution penetration. Indeed, Africa has been the market leader in the use of mobile money. Next, please. So there's some old concerns. 
and this is really the that's the background this is uh, against which anything you say about, about cyber uh, would have to be set um is that we are today in africa more than half comprised more than half the world's poorest people uh, that may change slightly it may go up indeed as a consequence of COVID, <clears throat> but still the fact remains we have more poor in africa than any other region and this is really a consequence of very poor governance of poor decisions uh, of history of legacy uh, of political and policy uncertainty and what this has done is it's made it very difficult to make investments it's raised the cost of making investments and it's discounted the reward and it's meant that many things where you you don't have to go to africa in other words not to dig something out of the ground or pump it out of the ground with uh, minerals or oil or gas you've simply gone elsewhere there's a lot of trading that happens but in terms of productive investments uh, it's really been on the margin which is why african uh, economies remain relatively undiversified and this is compounded of course by the fact that Africa has found it so difficult to trade with itself. Its borders have been not like European borders, which you drive through at 120 kilometers an hour, whatever the speed limit is around them. Uh, in Africa, you can spend weeks, if not months, waiting at borders, Kasum Beleza and other such places, uh, famous for their uh, desire to slow traffic down, to profit from the political economy of border posts. And of course, unless you change this way of doing things, unless you change this political economy, the boom and bust cycles of African governments, this is likely to be worsened by a combination of demography, things like climate change, and then by totally unexpected shocks like coronaviruses. The other big aspect, and this relates particularly to technology, is we have these very large increases projected. Um, they they don't seem to be, be moving any, to any degree off the path that they have been pro, uh, projected on. But the traditional labor intensive light manufacturing route that others have followed, especially in Southeast Asia, may no longer be an option, in part due to technology, but also in part uh, due to trade restrictions. So while Africa is trying to get better at trading with itself, hence the African uh, free trade area, the continental free trade area, the rest of the world seems to be moving into a far more mercantilistic, uh, um, uh, almost uh, national, uh, sort of nationalistic autarky in terms of global trade. And when it comes to thinking about cybersecurity and crime and the security challenges that are posed, this is not a new thing for Africa. That's the, uh, probably one of the key points I'd make. I'm sure many of you watching this have had many nice Nigerians offer you bountiful wealth and a, a, a prosperous, everlasting future through the infamous 419 scams. So, so email scams and other type of technological scams are not unknown to Africa, but it has changed. And it's changed in manners that have been indicated by the previous two speakers. Next, please. So the old concerns, if we had to represent them schematically, would look like this. We have a series of 54 fragile states, uh, and these fragilities are really founded in combinations of social governance and economic factors. They're fraught with uh, uh, identity problems along racial and ethnic and religious lines. The elites dominate, they're in many cases authoritarian, they don't want to give up power. Um, there's a traditional systems of agriculture and land retention, there's a lack of free media, free expression, free association. Educational systems are weak, the, the civil society is tends to be selected more on the basis of loyalty than on merit. Uh, and very much the economies are run on a zero-sum cultural uh, and economic way. If you have, I don't. So we don't aim at growth and re redistribution. We aim only to redistribute and to control. And all of this compounded by very high rates of population growth. On governance, we've spoken about many of these issues. 
uh, this is this is these threads are about accountability the fact that there's very little in the way of a tax base and again technology can change that there's a, a culture of rent seeking and culture of patronage and corruption of big man politics uh, that democracy is a simple facade on a far more complex uh, far more perverse political economy uh, and then this is always of course found out when this there's an inability to implement against the very the government's own plans because those plans look good but they're not really about the business of government the way things are really run with the net result that you have an economy uh, which in parts is rural based almost pre-market think of bits of south sudan for example that land use is hardly commercial it's mostly subsistence uh, in the rural areas there's very low population density which goes with of course very fragmented and rudimentary systems of governance there's very high dependence on natural resources and, and thus incomes nationally tend to track natural resource prices uh, and there's a system of unrestrained rent seeking limited uh, commercial banking availability the ability to borrow money to grow businesses and all of this amplified by uh, poor infrastructure um, and then a very negative, underpinned by a very negative relationship with the private sector. So that doesn't describe every country, as I've said, but it describes those that operate in the system of great fragility. Next, please. And then we have some more modern concerns aside from just COVID. Uh, and these relate to the fact that in Africa, and we heard hints of this in the previous session, is the form of cyber crime in Africa, as opposed to maybe African cyber crime, is changing significantly. And this tends to feed off regulatory and political and institutional weaknesses. As I've said, you're going to see this tremendous increase in mobile telephony penetration. Uh, by 2025, one quarter uh, of African populations are going to have access to 4 or 5G. And of course, what this does is increase massively the opportunities for cyber malfeasance, both economic, uh, but also political. And if you go back to what I said earlier about democracies doing better um, uh, for reasons of growth, and reasons of accountability and reasons of competitiveness, as well as reasons of human rights and other good things, uh, this is of great concern. Um, there's an increased ability for foreign countries to steer political processes across Africa in directions that they may favor. And there's a lack of corresponding regard already by some African elites uh, to resist this process. Uh, and as you've seen from that graphic that I briefly sh showed at the beginning, uh, there are many African states uh, most of whom are classified as dictatorships uh, or unfree, uh, who have used uh, um, their ability to shut down the internet to their advantage uh, in recent times. Um, and, and internet shutdowns are also correlated quite closely with the length of time that leaders have stayed in power. In other words, if they've been around for a long time, if they are a member of the facelift as opposed to the Facebook generation, which many African leaders are, they tend to feel quite uh, happy about pulling the plug at various times. Next, this is my second last slide, I think, Dave. Mm -hmm. And uh, as you see from this, a whole swath of African countries have disrupted the internet uh, in the last five years. So if you go to the last slide and bring up all four quadrants, uh, sorry, the second last slide, so if you look at the cyber oh, go back go back if you look at go back if you look at the cyber security uh, heat map uh, uh, there are bits down particularly in western africa uh, which look incredibly vulnerable uh, and it's not just about politics we felt it ourselves in south africa in the way of a narrative around economic reform being driven by certain interests by bots, by all sorts of tactics that have been employed during particular the era, era of state capture, as we've known it, and there's a big investigation, of course, going on into South Africa around the 
the, the, the reign of Jacob Zuma in this context, um, but certainly uh, there's a fight back occurring now, and certainly all of these are very closely connected with a, a certain narrative being plugged uh, into, um, uh, into uh, the South African uh, media space. I would say very bluntly that democracy and governance and transparency <laughs> are very powerful tools and advantages of the West in Africa. They're powerful tools because the majority of Africans prefer that way of operating. And bring up the last slide, all four quadrants. And if you were to do a SWOT analysis uh, in, on Africa, um, as I've said, there's, uh, we're poor, there's lots of upside because we're poor, we're close to Europe, close to the Middle East, we have a favorable long-term democratic trajectory. We're increasingly connected with the rest of the world. We talk the same language as much of the richer countries in the world, but we're poor. There's very opaque systems of governance. There's boom and bust economic cycles. There's an elite and often authoritarian political economy. We don't add much value to the things that we uh, trade uh, and our infrastructure and skills base is poor. The opportunities are the rest of the world's getting old. Um, we are congregating in urban areas to a much greater extent than hitherto. And there's pretty low growth elsewhere. Um, uh, and there's still uh, demand for commodities. And then finally, I would say that the big threats are if we don't respond to urbanization, we don't respond to demographic pressures, um, that democracy and governance stalls, that government is seen to be unresponsive uh, to this. Uh, climate change is a wild card, and that Europe potentially shuts its doors to Africa and doesn't allow that gentle let off of steam in the form of migrants and reverse flow of remittances. So sorry, I went on a little long. Some of it's due to the technological challenge of, of saying next, please, uh, 372 times, uh, but let me end here. Thanks, Greg. That's a really good overview of conditions in sub-Saharan Africa, which I think are going to be critical when we get to uh, the discussion. When we come back after the next uh, panel uh, presentation, I might ask you to expand a little bit on emerging and disruptive tech, particularly in things like banking and uh, the uh, penetration of mobile tech and how that might impact uh, both in terms of resiliency and security and the access to uh, development that you've been talking about. Um, so with that, I'm gonna, uh, introduce our next um, and, and final panelist for this afternoon. Um, this is uh, uh, a great pleasure uh, for us to have uh, one of the world's thought leaders on uh, innovation uh, and AI to be joining us. Uh, Dr. Sid Ahmed Ben Rowan um, is chair of the US International Standards Organization Working Group on Innovation uh, Management System Standards He's a member of the ISO Joint Committee in charge of developing international standards on AI. He advises senior government leaders and executive teams across the Middle East and North Africa on issues relating to emerging tech, uh, innovation and digital transformation. Uh, he spoke at the World Government Summit last year in the UAE uh, and at the BIDEC uh, Summit in Bahrain uh, as well. And he's a frequent uh, participant and speaker in regional events such as the Big Data uh, and Cloud Show uh, in Saudi Arabia, uh, the uh, Autonomous Driving Show uh, in UAE, and uh, the AI Summit in Mauritius. Uh, his number of publications, but his latest one focuses on AI and robotics, and he actually talks in that book a little bit about the uh, US national AI strategy. So with that, I'm gonna open the floor to Dr. Ben Rowan. Uh, and I know um, you have some slides to share. I look forward to hearing uh, from you on this question of emerging and disruptive tech. Thank you very much, uh, Dave. It's an honor uh, to be with you. Uh, it's also a pleasure to share the screen and to share the data and to share the information with uh, such uh, important and interesting uh, panels. Um, 
I thought I should talk uh, a little bit about the cybersecurity national uh, framework. As you mentioned, Dave, uh, I do most of my work, uh, advise uh, government officials, uh, leaders and senior leaders in the private sector as well, on how they can think of a strategic framework that can help them to implement uh, artificial intelligence, but more importantly, how they can think of the threats and the issues uh, that artificial intelligence uh, may uh, bring. But today for you and for your panel, I thought I should focus specifically on the cybersecurity because it has been the common threat conversation for these two panels. And I thought I would add uh, some uh, thoughts to what has been already uh, said by other uh, guests. So let me focus uh, in this maybe 10 or 15 minutes on some of the basic foundations that one has to think about when you are building a national strategy or a national framework for uh, cyber uh, security. Uh, let me say a word before I start about the very interesting time in which uh, we live, the deep digital transformation, the accelerated digital transformation uh, that we're all going through, uh, whether in the private sector or in the government sector, in the north or in the south, uh, developed or less developed countries, the entire globe is going through this deep um, transformation and we all have to think about it as an important uh, challenge that we are going to face. Uh, Jeffrey Emelt, who is the former CEO of GE, General Electric, which was one, uh, which is still one of the uh, greatest companies, the US companies that has been able to succeed the digital transformation and move from the industrial world to the knowledge world, from the industrial era to the knowledge era. He has a very famous quote that I like very, very much. And he says, quote, if you went to bed last night as an industrial company, you are going to wake up today as a software or an analytics company. And this is a very powerful uh, quote that speaks to the nature of the world in which we live. It's a powerful quote uh, that talks uh, specifically about the speed and the exponential growth in which uh, we live. Even if you have nothing to do with digital transformation, even if you have nothing to do with AI, you are going to be impacted by AI. And even if you have nothing or no connection with cybersecurity, you are going to have to worry about cybersecurity because if you don't, other people will do it uh, for you. When you look at the last maybe uh, five or seven years, you will see maybe three things happening. Number one, you see cyber attacks are more global. They are more mobile. They are higher cost. And more recently, they are becoming more political, which means they are affecting the social fabric of our political and social systems. Um, cyber attacks, uh, they cost about roughly in one estimate $17 million per week. Uh, this number has doubled exponentially compared to a previous uh, year. It is expected that the higher cost will reach uh, a, a cost of more than $2 trillion, uh, primarily in terms of recovering assets but more importantly in identity theft and other social and psychological uh, impact and effect that is very difficult to quantify. Uh, how does a cyber attack happen? Some of your uh, panelists have alluded to that, but you see it uh, happening a lot in the cloud. Uh, COVID-19 has uh, moved the entire economy into the cloud. We have became now more digital than in the past, and therefore the opportunities and the risk for cyber attack are also uh, higher. Most of companies, most of organizations, most of countries now are facing the 
issue of how to deal with remote workers and how you are able to prevent and to secure their uh, environment. And of course, uh, cyber attacks are not your traditional uh, uh, channels of computers, but they are coming primarily through uh, mobile uh, devices and through uh, social uh, media. Uh, when you look at uh, organizations and countries that are doing well and those who are not doing well, I call them in this slide achievers over versus overachievers, underachievers, sorry, over versus overachievers. What is the difference? What, what is it that the best organizations are doing in preventing attacks by opposition? to things that other companies or underachievers are not doing or are missing. Well, number one, you always look at the strategic uh, framework. Does your organization, does your country at the top level of the pyramid have a specific strategy that address cybersecurity and cyber attack and more broadly, information technology and artificial intelligence? In the private sector where you have institutions that are governing the organizations or watching for the companies, we call them most of the time board uh, members, are they engaged in the issue of cyber attack and cyber security? Are there awarenesses and training sessions and campaigns that are provided to employees and to members of the organizations? Are these awareness and training programs based on scenarios, testing, or simply some sort of once a year type of training that is mandatory by the law that you have to do? And then you look at technology. Does your country, does your organization invest in a leading technology that can help you prevent or protect your assets? Sometimes uh, those who are in finance uh, tend to uh, think of this investment as uh, waste and as lost um, uh, expenses, but when they get hit by attacks, then they realize that, in fact, uh, the best investment you can do is to protect, first of all, your identity, to protect your brand, and to protect your population. Um, do you have incident report at the level of the organization or the level of the country? Incident report are probably one of the most powerful tools that you can have that helps you to create this framework or to create this tracing of different attacks and identifying different uh, attacks. And then finally, do you have some sort of collaboration at the top of the organization and overachiever organizations and countries, they tended to have a very high, well-developed framework for collaboration between different units, between different institutions inside the country and outside the country, inside the organization, outside of the organization, that allow for tracing attacks and being able to understand different cyber um, attacks. On the other hand, Underachievers in preventing attacks, they tend to uh, have a highly fragmented uh, policy. You will see, first of all, some inconsistencies in government structures or in the government system itself that is in charge of cybersecurity protection. Uh, we don't know if it's the business of the IT or if it's the business of a different institution inside an organization. We don't know if it's actually the business of the Ministry of Telecom or a different ministry within uh, the country. And when you have this type of incoherences in governance structures, of course, these are uh, terrible uh, weaknesses that any attack could take, uh, uh, take advantage of. You also see as a consequence of the absence of governance structure, you also see a weakness in threat assessment tools and threat assessment methods. How do you evaluate your threats? How do you evaluate your strength? How do you evaluate your systems? That's an important question that you have to ask yourself and you need to pay attention to because again, it allows you to protect uh, yourself. 
underachievers, uh, countries, government institutions, and uh, organizations, they tend also to have uh, managerial practices that are not aligned with the objective for protecting a critical infrastructure. You see people talking a lot about the necessity and the importance of protecting the infrastructure, but when you look at the management practices, you don't see a good alignment between these uh, two. You see lack of information sharing mechanisms, and that's also another threat and another source of issues and problems that uh, could be a threat to the national infrastructure of the uh, country. And finally, in underachiever organizations, you see uh, an archaic uh, type of communication uh, methods uh, that do not emphasize the sense of urgency of the issue of cybersecurity. Cybersecurity, when there is an attack, everybody is talking about, but two weeks later, no one talks about cybersecurity and the necessity to protect your assets and the necessity to train your employees and to train uh, the people who are in charge of uh, different digital transformation uh, domain within the uh, organization. Very briefly, I wanted to share uh, with you, Dave, and with your audience, what I call uh, in my writing the human-centric uh, approach. Uh, this is something uh, that I gathered from a variety of sources, and when you read it, when you hear it, uh, it's very, very sobering. Uh, you will see, for instance, that 85% of cyber attacks uh, could be unsuccessful if IT staff has taken basic uh, steps. So if your IT department in your organization or if the people who are in charge of the uh, cybersecurity or the IT at the government uh, level, if they simply take basic steps, you would be able to prevent up to 85% of cyber attacks, 69% of former employees can still access their system. And this has to do again with the governance and with the structure that manage uh, different uh, systems within your organization. 50% of end users have taken data from their company. And that's actually a tremendous threat for organizations in the private sector as well as in the public uh, sector, specifically in today's uh, uh, world in COVID. Uh, time where basically everybody is working uh, remotely. 51% of worst uh, UK data breaches, this is specifically to the UK, are caused or were caused by staff error or uh, misuse. And 49% of companies do not perform employee security awareness training, something that is quite uh, important. This again comes from a study conducted by PwC in the US. And then 20%, 28%, of most of passwords, our passwords are breakable within 15 seconds. So when you read these um, statistics, statistics and this data, you will realize that there is a lot of things that we need to do as uh, 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 experts who are uh, really worried about this notion of this integration of cybersecurity uh, problems with uh, the digital uh, transformation. So. How would you design a national strategy framework? What would be the component of a typical framework for a national strategy? Uh, if you are the Ministry of uh, Telecom in the MENA region, or if you are a national agency in charge of IT, what are the basics of a, a typical national, uh, uh, AI, national uh, uh, cybersecurity uh, strategy? Well, you would want, first of all, you start from the top. And when you start from the top, you're talking specifically about the vision. There is how you can define the vision, how you can define the objectives, and how you can define the priorities for this uh, cybersecurity national uh, strategy. You need also to think about how you can implement risk assessment framework. And the risk assessment framework, it's a fundamental a process. At ISO, International Organization for Standardization, there is actually a standard that helps different uh, players to understand how you can run a threat assessment about 
your infrastructure, about your organization, and about your data, and about your uh, practices. Then you get into the core, and in the core, you need, first of all, to have an, an agency. Most of the time, it's a national agency that allows for the sharing of data and information, and the sharing of data and information allows you to be able to understand the threat and to trace uh, the threat. You need also to set up a national contingency plan, and in the national contingency plan is what if scenario, what would happen to my infrastructure in case of uh, a cyber attack happens. You need also to establish an incident reporting mechanisms, and an incident reporting mechanisms, it's a documentation that you have about different uh, cyber attacks, so you are able to create a profile for this type of attacks. And if you have an inventory of this type of incident, then over time, you will learn and you will understand the behavior of cyber attacks. And then, of course, you need also to stress test uh, your cybersecurity infrastructure. All that stuff that you have put together, does it work? Or it's simply a theoretical, an intellectual exercise that people like to uh, think about. In addition to that, this national strategy has to be also uh, uh, within a legal framework, define it within a legal framework. In a lot of countries now, specifically when it comes to cyber crime, there is a struggle on defining what is a cyber crime and how you can prosecute cyber uh, criminals. So there must be some sort of legal framework that helps different uh, companies, organizations to understand how they can operate in that legal uh, framework. And then that system that you create also has to be open to the world, meaning open to other parties, open to third parties, in order to create what we call interoperability. In other words, that system has to talk and has to figure out other uh, systems um, as well. You need also to have in this national framework also a focus on innovation and R&D. Uh, research and development is critical to developing information technology, generally speaking, and AI, artificial intelligence, but more importantly, how you can protect your assets and how you can protect uh, your infrastructure. And partnership with the private sector is a must. This is not simply a government issue. This is not simply a public issue or a private issue. It's something, this is something that is of interest and of concern to all players. So it is quite important for you if you are behind this national framework strategy that you open this uh, communication channels to uh, the private sector and to create this partnership so you are able to achieve uh, your goals. Of course, this framework will not uh, uh, be successful if it stays at the expert or at the technical uh, level. You have to make sure and you have to make an effort to push this framework and this information down to uh, the society so people know what it means and how they can protect themselves, whether we're talking about educational institutions around campuses, because that's where you have a lot of computers and you have a lot of networking and you have a lot of connections, or cyber coffee shops, uh, or companies, uh, or institutions, or employees. It is a must to have this type of information and this type of awareness campaign uh, awareness. And of course, you need to lead from the top. You cannot simply let uh, or put together these different pieces and assume is going to be on an autopilot uh, system. Someone at the top has to be in charge. Someone at the top has to worry about those things. And when you look at the MENA region, uh, this issue of cybersecurity, sometimes it's within a ministry of telecom, sometimes it's within a structure within the uh, prime minister office, sometimes it's outside of the uh, government uh, institutions. So someone at the top, at the highest level of the political uh, pyramid has to pay attention to that and has to push, if you will, for uh, this uh, national uh, framework. 
this is what I wanted to share with you, uh, Dave, um, in a very brief way uh, about how government officials and how companies and organizations should think of how to protect their digital transformation, their digital assets, and how they can think of their uh, cyber uh, security. And I'm looking forward to answer uh, any questions. Thank you, Sid. That was fabulous. Um, and what I'm going to ask you about in a minute, once we hear from Dr. Mills, is I, I really appreciated your human-centric framework for thinking about uh, thinking about cyber. I'd also like to ask you about cyber resilience for SCADA systems and industrial microprocessors, the kinds of autonomous devices that are part of the Internet of Things. Um, you know, as we know, cities like Neom in Saudi Arabia, um, basically any city in the UAE, uh, this Internet of Things is now a really important element of how big the attack surface is for cyber. So once we hear from uh, Dr. Mills on this issue of, of banking and, and mobile tech in Africa, I'd like to come back to you on that. Um, while we're doing that discussion, I'd like to encourage everyone that's listening online, and I know we've got a lot of people both on YouTube uh, and on the webinar to start posting questions. Uh, when we come back from a break after this uh, couple of questions, we're going to go to a general seminar uh, format where we'll have the opportunity to address all of those questions. So, uh, Greg, can I ask you to talk a little bit about this question of banking, uh, mobile tech, and uh, what these emerging and disruptive tech developments say for the broader points about Africa that you were mentioning earlier? Yeah, um, I think uh, you know, my fundamental response is that it's a good thing. <laughs> you know, what we've, what we've seen from M-Pesa in East Africa is the incredible appetite that consumers have when government gets out the way and that they can take uh, control over their own uh, affairs. Um, they don't have to walk long distances or drive long distances, which is normally at great cost. They simply use their mobile device to move money around. I do think, however, uh, that that's different. Mobile money transactions are very different to traditional banking, which is about collateralization. And one of the reasons that, uh, that interest rates remain very high across Africa is because of the high levels of risk uh, that and, and so the the very high ratios of of managers to to uh, debtors that you that you demand to be able to manage um, the risk accordingly very personally and often in many cases um, uh, and but and of course the, the the leveraging of of assets is critical in terms of of the, of the way in which business uh, is going to be uh, uh, grown across Africa um, and houses are going to be built and kids are going to be schooled and so on and so forth. So first point, I think there's a big appetite in Africa. We've already demonstrated. Second, second point is um, it's slightly different uh, in terms of, uh, of, of collateralization. And I think a third point I would make, uh, and maybe one quick PS is, is money is generally not the problem. Uh, I mean, I think one of the one of the consequences of COVID, it's a bit like the global financial crisis on steroids, is that now the world is simply awash uh, as a consequence of the fiscal responses that we have seen. I mean, by June this year, there was roughly eight trillion extra dollars inserted uh, into the global economy. Uh, the U.S. Uh, fiscal uh, response alone two and a half trillion dollars, uh, uh, which is some 13% of, of GDP. Germany's was astounding 33% of GDP. Japan even greater at 42% of GDP, and it's pretty much like that across the, the, the world. And that money is ultimately going to be looking for high returns somewhere. Uh, and in Europe, with a, a relatively mature market, and the same can be said for much of Asia today, um, people are going to be almost inevitably inclined to more of the frontier type, high risk but high return type market. So it's going to be incumbent on Africa to lower the, the uh, investment hurdles, uh, to lower the barriers to entry, 
Uh, and I think this will have a tremendous impact on, on everything in Africa, whether it be growth, whether it be uh, development prospects, whether it be um, uh, individual uh, fortunes, and of course the systems improvements that go with this are going to be consequential. Let me say the one PS, however. I think the one thing we have learned out of COVID, for sure, has been if you're not connected, you've got a problem. And this applies to companies as much as it does to individuals. Uh, and with three children at one at university and two at school, and watching them cope with online education, uh, um, it's clear that the kids who have those resources available are going to fare much better than those clearly who don't. And I think what you've seen out of online education generally has been that those that were struggling before are struggling even more today. And those that were doing pretty well before are doing even better. And it's, I would imagine that this kind of a highly digitized, a bandwidth dependent uh, economic uh, environment is going to create new opportunities, but it's also going to, unless governments respond very quickly and embrace the private sector, embrace uh, private investors, allow them into uh, to change uh, their, their telephony structures, because much of Africa remains closed, and not much of Africa, but certainly some key countries in Africa remain quite closed off in this regard. Unless they're willing to embrace wholesale um, the private sector and embrace new technologies, I think I suspect at a national level as well as an individual level, you're going to see a widening of these sorts of gaps, the gaps of, of access, but also the gaps of opportunity as a consequence. That's great. Thanks, Greg. Um, uh, Sid, could, could I ask you that question about uh, SCADA systems and uh, microprocessors that, that, that go along with the human-centric uh, element? Well, I think this is probably one of the most uh, interesting questions that you can think of if you are uh, thinking about uh, the safety and the security of uh, the system that you manage or uh, you uh, are in charge of. And uh, what is uh, clear now is that the uh, market of IoT uh, is becoming uh, more and more uh, important. Uh, the market of IoT, Internet of Things, that is, uh, is made of services, of connections, but also of software and uh, programs. And the most scary one is the software and uh, programs. Uh, it is uh, a major uh, headache and a major threat for most of organizations and companies. And you have heard probably uh, some stories where uh, people think now uh, about who is going to control uh, the brakes on my car if I am uh, using a car uh, that has uh, devices uh, that uh, can actually brake or can break the brake or can uh, make the car uh, out of control uh, if the car is being uh, hacked to. You can also uh, think of other uh, means of transportation. You can think of aircrafts, for instance, who has access, if you will, to those sensors and those uh, data and those softwares that you have in an engine. A while ago, I read an article, a very interesting article about uh, this specific issue. Uh, who has access to uh, the sensors that you find in a typical uh, aircraft engine? Is it the uh, manufacturer of the engine, and that could be GE or Rolls-Royce, or is it Boeing, the, the, the company that is putting together the engine with other parts of the airplane, or the company that runs the airplane uh, itself. The company that makes the engine would be very, very interested in getting the data and information from the sensors that uh, are in uh, that engine so they can learn and they can develop perhaps better and more efficient and more sophisticated uh, systems. Boeing also as a company who's making together or putting together these different parts uh, would be very interested in that information as well. And of course, the uh, company that operates uh, the uh, aircraft as well. 
the top of that, of course, you've got the hackers who also would want to get access to that uh, information. So yes, Internet of Things, uh, Dave, is becoming a serious threat. Uh, the more digital we become, uh, the more problems we're going to have to think about. And that's why we need to think in a smart way. We need to focus on developing a framework because we cannot succeed uh, in securing or uh, making a digital transformation safe for everybody uh, without a national framework, without a framework within the organization that defines the rules, but more importantly, teaches and helps people to understand how they can deal with some basic information, basic steps that protect them, uh, protect uh, their identity and protect their uh, safety. I like very much uh, what uh, Mr. Willis has just said about uh, how now our kids are uh, taught remotely. And uh, obviously not all the kids in the world, uh, some kids, and this is another issue we can also address later, uh, some kids have been uh, luckier than others, uh, some kids are actually taking, still taking classes online uh, because of this COVID situations, but other kids have not been back to school for months and months, and that's a serious uh, issue to which we have to pay attention. But let's just assume that maybe uh, you are in a country or in an organization where your kids are still in school, so it's critical that you teach them about uh, this notion of uh, cyber attacks and protecting themselves and learning and integrating and internalizing, if you will, uh, this uh, threat. The more interconnected we are, the uh, less autonomous we become uh, on each other. So it's important that we work uh, together, private uh, companies, public institutions, society at large, and this uh, seminar that you organized uh, with your partners, Dave, is actually one uh, step towards uh, that. Thank you, Sid. Um, so with that, what we're going to do now is take a 10 minute break. We're going to leave the seminar link open. We'll just have a, a countdown timer and that'll hopefully allow people to get a cup of coffee or whatever. Uh, we're going to come back and do some very uh, interesting questions that have come in from the audience on YouTube and also on the webinar. And we're going to start with questions for Dr. Ben Rowan and Dr. Mills, and then we're going to open up to all four of the panelists for a general um, uh, session. So thanks everybody for all your great questions and please do keep them coming. And we've got uh, a lot of interesting questions in the next session. Uh, so with that, we'll take a 10 minute break uh, and then reconvene. Welcome back, everybody. Um, we've had some really great questions uh, from YouTube and also from the webinar over the break. Uh, the first one is uh, from a YouTube viewer, and it's for uh, Professor Ben Rowan. Um, Sid, the question is, um, I understand that you'll need a national strategy but what is the status of those kinds of strategies in Africa and the Middle East? Are countries able to do this uh, strategic planning themselves or do they need to have stronger institutions first? Well, I think uh, it's uh, one of those questions uh, that you have to address uh, while you are building uh, the different governance uh, institutions. Uh, the challenge uh, for African countries, most of African countries, is that this is something that you cannot deprioritize. Uh, it is as important as other institutions. And yes, in a lot of countries, there is a lack of technical expertise. There is a lack of um, technical uh, staff. But there are also a lot of opportunities within these uh, universities, around campuses and around the private sector, and if these governments are open and they have a clear strategy on how to target skills and talent and experts around campuses and integrate them into uh, the fabric of the national strategy, I am sure uh, you will uh, end up with uh, a very uh, important and a good uh, framework. But yes, uh, it is a challenge. 
But when you look around what you have in different R&D centers uh, around African countries and around campuses, there are a lot of uh, skills and talents that you may not be aware of. Thanks. And um, Gregor? You hear David? I think we lost the uh, sound on David's uh, side, Greg. You can hear me still, Greg, right? I, I can hear and see you fine. Yeah, I can't hear David at all. Yeah, I think we lost his connection, so maybe he will come back. Um, while we wait for David to come back, um, I'd like to pose this question to the panel. Um, how can countries in the MENA region mitigate the risks of cyber attacks, given the fact that internet, satellites, hardware, and software are entirely imported either from China or the West? Um, I'd like to just put that out to generally to the panel, if uh, anyone uh, can respond to that. Okay, go ahead. Why don't you take a look? Uh, well, it's not really my region, so I said, why don't you uh, have a crack at this? Well, I think um, it's uh, important, as we said, uh, to uh, think of the digital transformation first as an opportunity and to set up the different policies and strategies within the framework of the country to be able to develop those uh, nascent uh, technologies so you are able to create some sort of autonomy on other countries and on other uh, regions. In other words, try to build the capacity internally first. Once you are able to succeed in building the digital transformation and to conceptualize the meaning of digital transformation and what it means for your economy, what it means for your schools, what it means for your competitiveness at the national, international level. Then comes the next question, which is how can I protect myself from the threats that are coming uh, within uh, this uh, strategy? I think uh, Greg said some very good things earlier about uh, how Africa is coming back. And I think there are a lot of things that you can find in a lot of African countries uh, that uh, you can capitalize on human capital, for instance, the um, uh, new economic and political uh, dynamic, the possibility of growth. All these things, I think, uh, would be a good opportunity. And I let Greg, of course, talk about that because you probably have addressed some of it in your uh, talk. Yeah, thank you very much. I mean, I, I and it goes to your earlier answer as well. Said, um, you know, the 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 skill space certainly exists. I mean, I made the joke about uh, four one nine scams in Nigeria, um, but uh, uh, cyber crime uh, and cyber savviness go hand in hand. Uh, and some of the uh, the, the the most uh, I think innovative tech hubs are springing up. Uh, across eastern parts of Africa, indeed, and bits of West Africa as well. 
Um, I think our challenge in Africa remains actually retention of talent, um, which of course is highly mobile in this world, and then being able to find the mechanisms to translate uh, startups into businesses, uh, uh, which of course is a challenge everywhere in the world, uh, but particularly in Africa, given the weakness of venture capital uh, uh, systems and, and, and financial structures. So I think the talent is there. I think the challenge is much more governmental. Um, does government want to firstly acknowledge this as a threat? Secondly, be willing to work together with people who really understand this. Uh, and in some cases, uh, I would venture even many cases, uh, this is outside of government. Um, uh, and government's willingness to give up control would be, I think, uh, a first in, in this regard, given that many in government see control of the digital space as being to their advantage, both financially uh, as well as uh, in security terms. So I think there's a, there's a tension here between state and government. Uh, there's a tension over control. There's a tension about who uses it to whose advantage uh, financially uh, and in terms of security matters. But I would say, I think that uh, the talent does exist. It has to be channeled. It has to be recruited. It has to be competitively paid for. Um, but it does it does operate already uh, in Africa. I, I do believe the challenge is more from the government side, acknowledging and accepting um, that this is a domain that they probably don't have uh, the, the 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 wherewithal to to manage. You're back, Mr. Chairman. I am, and I uh, we were we've been talking about cyber attacks all morning, and I've suddenly lost all connectivity and had to reboot everything. So someone's obviously listening to our, our conversation. I want to bring the other two panelists in as well, um, Jasa and, and Professor Mazur. Um, before we do that, though, the Parliamentary uh, Association of the Mediterranean have asked if they could have uh, a couple of minutes to turn their video on and address the panel. So why don't we hear that intervention first and then we'll uh, react um, afterwards. Jesse, can you um, can you make that work? The Parliamentary Assembly for the Mediterranean that I'm representing today. Uh, you talked about two main things. The first one is the policy that should be there, and this in in the different countries. And the second one is the cyber crime. And we all know that um, we are as weak as the weakest link. So if there is a weak one weak country. It could be a vulnerability for all of us. So what I, I, I need uh, is that there should be a cooperation between the PAM and the NATO to disclose the different legislations that are there for the cybersecurity in the countries that were already advanced to the other countries that are not like really advanced. This will help like to make a stronger um, legislations and stronger policies in the companies based on the legislations. And as Dr. Um, Zaid Ahmed has mentioned, uh, also the, the, the policy itself. There should be a national policy for each country. And I believe that the national policy and the legislations work like side by side. So in brief, not to make things long, that there is a need to disclose and to distribute and co and to exchange the different cybersecurity laws and to make to bring the attention for the countries that have weaker cybersecurity laws to make stronger ones. Thank you very much. So this this strikes me as a strong argument for something that came up in the first panel about the NATO resilience agenda and how that might um, be a useful basis for conversation with countries in, in the Mediterranean broadly, but in, in Africa uh, and the Middle East. Um, Dr. Benaran, would you like to start on that and perhaps uh, Professor Mazur can follow? Yeah, of course. I think, uh, I'm sorry, I didn't uh, pick up the name of the lady who spoke on behalf of the Mediterranean um, uh, European uh, Parliament. I I'm apologize, I couldn't Marianne. Uh, copy the My name, name is Marianne. Uh, Marianne, Marianne. Yeah, Marianne, thank you very much. That was actually a very powerful uh, contribution, and I liked uh, 
when you said that uh, we are as weak as the weakest link. Uh, we are highly interconnected society and there is no way for me uh, to do well if you are not doing well and there is no way for you to do well if the other uh, neighbor is not doing well. So this is a moment uh, for call, for collaboration, for cooperation. Uh, if we have to do something uh, now, it's uh, to open up our doors and to open up our policies so we can teach other and we can learn uh, from uh, each other. Uh, when I do this type of conversation with uh, policymakers around the MENA region, um, I tell them it doesn't help you if you are a Ministry of Telecom or a Ministry of Education and Ministry of uh, Higher Ed and you are not working with the private sector and you are not teaching or helping uh, the private sector and the startups uh, because if they get hit make sure they will get you will get hit as well uh, because most likely in your system you've got some of their softwares and some of their uh, devices uh, so it is critical uh, to be open to uh, the other and to make sure that you are well connected and also you are helping and you have this uh, collaborative uh, uh, perspective on uh, this policy making. Thanks for that. Um, Rita, would you like to add anything to that and in terms of particularly the, the issue of um, collaboration among different countries? So I, I totally agree. I mean, cybersecurity, I like to say that, I mean, cybersecurity you, to do cybersecurity well, the main thing you need is expertise and, well, is expertise. And expertise, I mean the technical expertise, but also the policy, the strategy, etc. You don't need some heavy equipment, you don't need anything. <laughs> you, you, you need awareness, the, the expertise, and this, it needs to be shared. So there is no way, so things like the, the, things like the NATO does is training other countries and sharing of expertise. I think it's wonderful. It's extremely important because that's how we progress in cybersecurity is by sharing knowledge. I, I showed in my slides this OTX, which is a platform of people like deliberately sharing incidents they've seen online. Like my organization has been attacked with this malware, and people know that there is a problem. This is this is great. Sharing knowledge, training. I think there is no other way to go other than that. You cannot reinvent the wheel, things change so much. And sometimes people, and this training, it's hard to, like, like some people may be scared because they think a foreign country is gonna see what I do, but it, it doesn't need to be. They just, the training can happen without another country having access to the internal systems. And there's no other way around it. It's not just, it's important, it's the only way to go, I think. Yeah. Um, Joshua, would you like to add anything to that? I think this this topic exceeds my uh, my domain here. And I think I would leave it to Miss uh, to Professor Rita and Mr. Uh, Sid. And I think their remarks actually make a lot of sense and that, and that, that they actually, take into consideration not only the, the um, abilities and the challenges that this region faces when it comes to cybersecurity, but also how how they can incorporate policies that match uh, NATO's and not, not, not match NATO's, but at least be uh, integrated within NATO's policy and NATO's strategy for cybersecurity. Yeah, great. Yeah, I want to just raise a slightly different curved ball, if I may, for uh, for those uh, within the NATO context. Is is I would venture that the the greatest challenge to to at least African countries uh, from cyber comes in the form of election tampering uh, and essentially being able to work for the most part for incumbents to be able to tamper, fiddle, gerrymander, tinker, uh, pick your verb, um, with the election processes and outcomes uh, in, the, in favor of the incumbent. Uh, a part of that, of course, is fake news. Part of that is, is 
let's say, kindly narrative building um, uh, and so on. If that, for me, is at least the greatest threat in terms of the immediate term threat for cyber, uh, there's a range of other things about, you know, uh, the, the commercial security, uh, uh, infrastructure security, and so on and so forth. But I would argue that that's the big macro strategic level threat. Here's a challenge for NATO is that it's not about people outside of NATO necessarily doing this. It's about consultants and individuals within NATO countries operating uh, and doing this in Africa. So when it comes to, to uh, you know, managing the digital space, uh, the resilience agenda, as it is, should really look very closely at NATO's own actors, not just simply those coming from outside of NATO. The consultants that tramp all over Africa are, um, are, are come mostly from Western Europe. Um, there's some in this field who come from Israel, um, very big on, on, on cyber, uh, um, uh, but they mostly come from Western Europe uh, and from the United States. So, so when we think of a macro strategic threat, when we think of cyber and politics and fake news and everything else, uh, we don't have to necessarily go out of a NATO context uh, to appreciate this. Thanks, Greg. This raises a question for me that you may have addressed as a group when I was busy wrangling my, my cyber uh, collapse. Um, but, uh, you know, the US and China are currently just decoupling economically. They are beginning increasingly to regard each other as adversaries. Uh, and they're in the midst of what some people call a tech war uh, that relates in part to um, uh, manufacturing of silicon uh, chips to antennas for 5G systems to variety of hardware. Uh, the COVID pandemic, which both Sid and, and Greg raised in, in, in a very good way, has really impacted that. Uh, and in fact, we've seen a significant shift in opinion toward uh, China in Africa and in the Middle East over the past six months, uh, and indeed in Europe as well, where a lot of the assumptions about Chinese participation in systems like 5G uh, have really been shaken by what's going on in the past few months. I wonder if the panel could address this question. You know, the Middle East and, and Africa uh, don't really have the luxury of cutting themselves off from uh, the world's second largest economy and one of the most important investors, uh, nor do they necessarily want to be part of a, let's call it a European or US plantation as far as uh, uh, technology is concerned. But we're moving towards what some people now call the splinter net, right, where there are different internets depending on your, your political or geopolitical orientation, different hardware, different communication systems. How do we feel about, about that in the context of what it means for countries in uh, Africa and the Middle East? Uh, I might start with Professor Ben Rowan again, and then we'll go around the, the group. Well, I think uh, times are changing, uh, uh, Dave, and uh, the current geopolitical situation is uh, terrible as it gets. Uh, this war that you alluded to, uh, this fight, this um, tension uh, that exists over everything from economics to immigration to uh, labor work to uh, tech. Uh, it is uh, uh, scary and I think uh, COVID in many ways has complicated that, um, has created a new rift uh, in the way we perceive reality and that sometimes is not helpful when you're trying to focus uh, people's attention on what is more critical for the survival of the species. Um, I think we are uh, overdue for uh, a reset. Uh, I am hoping that uh, in the next future, uh, things maybe will change. Uh, we will have maybe uh, better leaders that uh, are up to our ambitions and up to our uh, hope and uh, that will change the dynamic whether we're talking about 
uh, foreign direct investment or talking about uh, tech industry or talking about uh, collaboration. The current state school does not help anyone. It does not help the superpower. It does not have, it doesn't help the less power uh, people. So it is uh, as messy as it gets. And my hope uh, is that uh, we will see uh, a new agenda as we see things happening around the world. Thanks. Jasa, would you like to chime in on that, that question? Yeah. So I think one of the main major points here that we need to consider is that China is providing countries in the region, in the Middle East, with cheap and efficient solutions to enhance their uh, cyber capabilities, in the sense that whether it's the, they are providing them with 5G uh, networks, uh, facial recognition systems and softwares, uh, digital authoritarian uh, softwares and tools that that uh, enhances an autocratic regime uh, oppression and suppression and uh, mass surveillance over its citizens. So the, the problem is that not only is China providing these cheap and efficient uh, tools, but without any regards or lectures about human rights and digital rights and the uh, democracy that the West insists on having, which sounds much more appealing to an autocratic regime surviving in a, in a, yani, uh, on a very fragile ground and fearing social arrest any given day. With that in mind, we also need to take into consideration the media and uh, disinformation campaigns that China is um, uh, yani, uh, creating to depict Western technologies and the West uh, uh, tools and technologies and software as malign and just as bad, or not just, just as bad, but just as, um, what's the word for it? Controlling as the Chinese softwares and tools. So I do agree there's a split, but in my opinion, for less capable, less able countries to afford the more expensive Western technologies and to avoid the whole lecture and the whole, um, yeah, I mean, regulations about human rights and uh, we shouldn't do mass surveillance and we should give the people the right to express themselves. They can just go to China and get, get all the software and the hardware they want, no strings attached, much cheaper and much more efficient. And the Chinese would be more than happy to make a, to, to leave a footprint or to get their, their foot in the way uh, in any region, uh, in any country across the region. Rita, what do you think? No, I'll just not answer this question. It's not really my area of expertise, this whole thing. Okay, I mean, I, I think it, there's an interesting uh, angle here, Greg, on some of the points that you were bringing up uh, when you were talking about how COVID gives a, an incentive or an opportunity for some countries to become more authoritarian. Uh, China obviously already has had some very deep penetration in terms of infrastructure across the continent. How would you see this uh, this question? I think, uh, you know, the the changing relationship of China, it's an excellent question, by the way, the changing relationship of China with Africa has been the big story in Africa of the 21st century. It's changed Africa, Africa's perception as a problem to be solved by the West or in the West uh, as a business opportunity to be entertained. And that's largely been driven by what China's uh, done uh, in terms of its own commercial relationship with Africa. So its trade has gone in the past uh, 20 years, 25 years, from $5 billion of two-way trade to somewhere north of $150 billion of two-way trade. And there's a tremendous amount of investment behind that as well. Now, you can argue about how much of that benefits Africa, whether it should benefit Africa more than does benefit Africa, how much technology transfer there is, there's all sorts of questions about it, but it has fundamentally changed the nature of the image of Africa in the international community. Uh, and what Africa really needs is not less globalization, but we need more globalization. Our problem is we're not particularly globalized. We, we don't trade relative to our share of the global population anything like the volumes that we should be. And our share of global wealth is, 
in the order of two and a half percent when it should be more like our population numbers which is 15 percent or more mm. given the size of our youthful population which is 25 percent of the world's youth so we, we we've we've rapidly tried to find ways to catch up uh, as my one graph of the digression between Africa and Asia illustrated, and we need all the partners we're going to get. And as um, it was said earlier, you know, China offers a cheap avenue uh, to be able to get lots of stuff, um, some of it low tech, uh, from flip flops all the way to uh, to digital technologies. So, and and it's because of that ability to compete in the African market space to deliver in volume and at a price point that is attractive to African consumers that China's made such inroads, plus its ability to, course, to do deals and to build infrastructure in places that the West no longer really likes to build infrastructure. Um, you find Chinese uh, road engineers in the most remote places of, place of Africa, and I always scratch my head when I come across them, thinking, hell, how, you know, how the hell do they get out here? Um, but they do, and uh, they are delivering infrastructure again on scale. There's a great African proverb which says, when two elephants fight, the grass suffers. Uh, and we're the grass. Um, and if the elephants are going to have a scrap of our things, then we are probably going to suffer. So, so I think what the West has to do, if it wants to engage with Africa, is adopt a position that says what does africa need now it may be things stuff it may be support for values and as i've already pointed out two-thirds of african citizens want democracy they felt that they fought for it bitterly over the last generation and they want to hang on to it because it's better than the alternative no matter how dire democracy is at times um, and they need support for that they don't want to be given rhetorical support uh, or uh, people telling them that they're great. They want actually some support, some reward for fighting these good fights and aligning themselves in a particular way. Um, they want reward from their own government. They want reward from the international community, terms of trade. They want uh, access to markets. Uh, they, want, uh, they want investors to come in. They want to lower these costs and whoever can offer that is going to be a friend of Africa. So we shouldn't have to pick friends. Um, we should be able to, to we, we shouldn't be forced to pick friends. We could pick our friends depending on what it is that they offer. And I think the, the challenge finally for, for, for the West in Africa is, is it's really being caught napping. Uh, by the Chinese, and the Chinese have stolen the march in, in market access, in doing business, uh, in being far more forward-leaning uh, than Africa, in cutting some corners at times, of course we know that, um, uh, in governance terms, but they have been very forward-leaning, and the West has to play catch-up, and I just think that attacking China is not catch-up, <laughs> that's attacking China. Uh, getting aligning yourself with Africa is a different is a different question. That's a great point. Um, so we're into the very final plenary session. I might ask the um, panelists to stay on the screen for the moment. Um, I'm going to work through just a very brief summary of some of the main points that were made, uh, and then we're going to ask the sponsors, um, Ally Command Transformation, and the NATO Southern Hub to offer some uh, closing remarks. So, you know, it's been a, a long session and we've covered a huge amount of ground uh, with our panelists. And, you know, you could, you could spend hours talking about all the main points that have been brought out, but I just want to highlight a few. Uh, Professor Mazur talked a lot about uh, mobile connectivity, how more than half the population in Morocco is now on social media, there's this massive attack surface for cyber security and cyber crime, but people are not necessarily prepared for that. She mentioned the mismatch between the educational system and what it's producing and the needs of the job market. Um, and this is something that uh, if we think back to the Arab Spring, uh, 
was a factor for countries like Libya, Egypt, Tunisia, where the kinds of graduates that the educational systems were producing were not suited to the nature of the economy of those countries. And that combined with a youth bulge led to a really major uh, groundswell of unrest that was part of the Arab Spring. So youth as a stakeholder was one of the other key points that Professor Mazur made. And the fact that youth are often not listened to. Um, and she highlighted the, the possible good usage of AI as a solution for employment issues. She also mentioned the fact that um, because of the inequality of access to data, um, there's a reliance on uh, institutions such as cyber cafes that aren't necessarily uh, as popular elsewhere anymore. Uh, and she gave that scary statistic a 60% of those sites being infected by malware. Um, she talked a lot later in the Q&A about the degree to which uh, Morocco is representative of the rest of, um, of Africa. And I think well, um, that was another key point that Dr. Mills made later. Uh, one point that I think didn't quite get the emphasis that it needed until a little bit later was this question of urbanization. Um, and uh, I'll come back to that when we talk about uh, Dr. Mills. Um, then we had some really good insights from Jasser al Tahat about disinformation um, as a strategic problem, not a technical problem, a tool to further strategic objectives um, in polarized and fragile uh, intrastate uh, society uh, in the Middle East. But of course, I'm caught dialing in from the United States. It's not in any way unique to uh, the Middle East. And this, again, another thing that's not unique is a legacy or traditional media ecosystem that lacks integrity or credibility uh, with the audience. Um, just I mentioned that audiences are turning to more disinformation vulnerable channels, uh, that anti-Western narratives are gaining over Western narratives or Western channels in the region. We talked about internet assault forces, how state and non-state actors are seeking to influence uh, public opinion. Uh, he talked a little bit about ambiguous actors where Russia, even though it's supporting the Bashar al-Assad regime in Syria, was also sponsoring what the Russians call political engineering efforts through the internet research agency and others to try to um, force different policy changes on behalf of, uh, uh, of the, the Assad regime. And in fact, one of the general themes here is the notion of cyber militias or cyber proxies acting as an adjunct to traditional diplomatic and military pressure on either your own government or another government. And this, of course, is something that's picked up very heavily in the Chinese notion of public opinion warfare, part of their uh, three warfares doctrine, which is um, not exactly the same as information operations. It's a, a really focused issue on framing the prior public opinion landscape that shapes the decision options for an adversary. Uh, we talked a bit in Q&A about the link between online uh, narrative manipulation and physical demonstrations and protests uh, in the world. And we talked about the possibility of AI driven influence campaigns um, and the fact that we may be in an environment where in order to avoid attribution, uh, cyber actors may be using AI that's geographically uh, offset from their location to influence directly uh, public opinion or um, manipulate uh, political processes elsewhere. Uh, Dr. Mills talked about Africa and gave the great overview of, of a series of uh, key factors to consider when thinking about the environment in Africa um, with an emphasis on strategies to help economies grow and diversify and handle this current systemic shock of COVID-19. He talked about globalization, um, growth, diversification and investment. He talked about technology and data with falling costs and rising access. When he was talking about that, it made me think about whether we're actually talking about two Africas or many Africas in terms of the, the different environments uh, across uh, different parts of the continent. He talked about government's relationship with its citizens. Uh, and how COVID is actually altering that and creating greater opportunity for authoritarianism 
uh, something we picked up later when talking about China's appeal to countries in the Middle East and uh, in Africa. Talked about the impact on human security uh, and migration uh, of COVID where it's gonna increase push factors uh, alongside demographics and food security and pre-existing issues to uh, really push uh, countries to, um, to, to deal with that, that, that challenge. Talked about the impact on health and floated the idea that health might be the new wealth uh, in this environment. And then the question of consumerism, which is particularly relevant for Africa in that, as other panelists mentioned, very large chunks of the global economy are now moving online. And we're also seeing a deglobalization or a, um, a decoupling between the US and China. And that really poses a significant risk for Africa that uh, it may just not get the access that it deserves to this newly structured uh, global economy. And then finally, um, Professor Ben Rowan talked about thinking about a strategic framework for AI, um, looking at software and analytics as the new uh, key element of business and of uh, the economy rather than industrial production. Uh, he located that in a, in a broader framework of this deep digital transformation, which is something that Professor Mazur talked about as well in, in her presentation at the beginning. Uh, and in terms of thinking about that as a really important challenge, the speed and the exponential growth of data and analytics turn out to be a really important factor when you think about uh, the impact of cyber attacks, which can be larger, more damaging, more mobile and global. Uh, and again, uh, a point that's come up multiple times today, uh, Professor Ben Rowan talked about how COVID has moved very large parts of the global economy online and linking that back to what the earlier panelists talked about, that creates a greater attack surface for a potentially uh, hostile adversary. Uh, I really like the way that Professor Ben Rowan looked at underachievers and overachievers and focused in particular on issues like fragmented structures, weak governance, uh, blurred lines of accountability, uh, and then emphasize the human centric uh, approach. And then in our discussion uh, around some of those issues, we talked about cyber resilience uh, for SCADA systems and industrial controllers uh, for the internet of things. Uh, and we looked at a whole variety of associated issues uh, to do with that. I wanna end before throwing back to uh, our sponsors by just uh, reminding people of something that I said earlier about the NATO resilience agenda. So for several years, NATO has been working on issues associated with Article 3, the, the self-help and resilience article. A number of countries within the NATO alliance that are under threat from outside have adopted a strategy of deterrence through resilience, demonstrating to an actual or potential adversary uh, that it wouldn't be particularly useful to, to attack them because they're already prepared and resilient. We've seen this from countries in the uh, in the Scandinavian and Baltic regions, but we've also seen it uh, from allies of the alliance or, or partners of the alliance in, in Africa and the Middle East as well. And in addressing resilience, NATO identified seven key baseline requirements on continuity of government, uh, resilient energy supplies, the ability to deal with uh, mass population movement, to guarantee resilient food and water resources, to handle mass casualties, something that became extremely topical this year, particularly in ensuring that civilian health systems can cope and that there are sufficient, su sufficient uh, medical supplies uh, stockpiled and secure. One that's very central to this discussion today uh, the NATO resilience requirement around civil communication systems, ensuring that telecoms and cyber networks can function uh, even under crisis conditions with sufficient backup uh, capacity. And then finally, resilient transportation systems so that um, civilian and military assets can move freely through the environment. And this gets us back to the, uh, the attacks on, on infrastructure that we talked about at the beginning. So an incredibly rich discussion, and I want to thank all the members of the audience and people from uh, YouTube and from the webinar platform who contributed so many great 
questions to the discussion and I, you added hugely to the richness of the conversation. Um, with that, I'm gonna throw back to uh, the NATO ACT organization in Norfolk. Unfortunately, Admiral Tamman has been called away, uh, but we're fortunate to have uh, Colonel Gent Marion from the Belgian Air Force, who's part of the um, ECOS SPP team at ACT. So Colonel Marion, over to you. Hi, uh, good morning or uh, good afternoon, depending on the location, of course. Um, unfortunately, as you said, uh, Admiral Tebman uh, is not available for the moment. Um, I'm Colonel Gary Marion of the Belgian Air Force. Um, I work in the uh, strategic plans and policy branch of the headquarters. I work for the, for the Admiral and I'm uh, speaking on his behalf. Um, despite a few uh, technical issues in the beginning of the, of the uh, event, I think we uh, may call this very successful uh, webinar uh, on uh, emerging and disruptive technologies in the Middle East and Africa. Um, on behalf of the uh, Admiral, I would like to thank you, uh, Dr. McKillop, for your uh, excellent job today. I also want to thank the speakers, of course, for their excellent presentations, uh, their uh, excellent lectures, and for sharing their, um, their wisdom and their thoughts with the audience. And finally, I would like to thank the audience uh, for their participation in this webinar and um, for their interest in this subject. And uh, we certainly do hope that we may uh, welcome them again in our future uh, events. That's all I have, uh, over. Thank you, sir. Um, and back then to uh, the NATO Southern Hub in Naples. Thank you, David. Um, first of all, uh, let me join uh, my Air Force Belgian colleague from ACT. Good morning, good evening, everybody from Naples. Uh, was really honored to attend this event. Uh, thank you, first of all, to our great panelists for the high level of expertise that they brought on the table, discussing about these uh, new challenges and complex scenarios. Thank you also for the audience, because uh, at the salt uh, of this discussion also uh, produced by the uh, questions uh, that were uh, addressed to our experts. Uh, just to conclude, uh, complex scenario really needs uh, complex analysis and uh, thoughts. And uh, probably, again, as was mentioned, expertise, of course, is key, but also the human factor. And um, COVID-19, as you saw, has re uh, recently changed our uh, way of doing business. And if I look into my country, for instance, or the European countries mainly, cyber crimes that were addressed during the, the discussion were just increasing the number, just because we were mainly connected uh, through internet, uh, through uh, digital media, and of course we were not going uh, shopping like we normally do. Uh, the hub role is to connect civilian society organization, uh, think tanks, academia, from the MENA region, mainly Middle East and Africa, the Policy Center for the New South, uh, for instance, in Morocco, the African Union Center, uh, for research and, uh, and uh, strategy on terrorism in Algeria. These are just one of them. And through uh, the interaction with uh, those regional experts, the regional eyes, we can finally understand the regional perspective, which added the salt uh, to our studies. And coming back to the human factor, I have to admit that the hub success was just this new change in mentality from NATO. Looking for driver on instability, looking to security worldwide, but also, just to make a simple example, we learn so much just interacting with new partners, with friends in the Middle East and Africa, just because simply we look things from a different perspective. And also, if I need to look backwards, 1949, NATO was created as a military and political alliance for deterrence mainly, for defense capabilities, and I couldn't imagine that in 1998, when I joined the Air Force Academy, NATO could have been discussing about climate change, human trafficking, human smuggling, uh, and uh, of course, uh, emerging disrupting technologies. So we all change. And again, uh, just the interaction with the uh, high level experts like you, uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen, gave us a great opportunities to grow and to understand the security implication in the future agenda. Thank you very much. Have a great day and a great evening, everybody. Thanks. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Pleasure.